At the time of this story, my family and I lived in Northeast Ohio. Most of our extended family on my father's side lived in Central Florida. So for the Christmas holidays, we would go and spend time with my grandparents and aunts and uncles. At the time I was six years old, my brother Russ was four, and my brother Chase was two, and my brother Braden was four months. The trip down to Florida was uneventful. We did not come across any car wrecks or anything of interest. It was a very long drive though, especially with a four month old baby. We drove in a red minivan that was loaded down to clothes and toys. You could imagine all the toys that we bought to celebrate our Christmas, along with what our grandparents were going to give us. Christmas with my grandparents was fantastic. We had aunts and uncles and lots of cousins. We ate, talked and played. There were tons of toys and new outfits. When the time came to go home, we had twice as much as what we came with. My mum had to put our clothes in trash bags and pack them underneath the seats and on the floorboards of the van. When we climbed in, we were walking on top of our toys and clothes and we didn't mind it much being kids. We started our long trip back. After we went north for a while and were in a different state, my dad realized that we were losing gas incredibly fast. We had to stop several times to fill up. And that's when my dad decided to stop at a mechanics. We had spent all of our extra money in Florida and my parents had not planned on having to stop to get the van serviced. It was kind of neat and kind of annoying at the same time to be stuck in this mechanic shop, not having the money for a hotel or even a motel. So we spent the night in the car while it was up in the lift at the mechanics worked underneath it. Loud, noisy, and not smelling very good. After lots of money and being stuck in a mechanic shop for a while, my dad decided that enough was enough and we were going to leave. A lot of improvements had been made to the van, but the main problem was not fixed. Back on the road, we finally made it to the Smoky Mountains. It was beautiful considering that it was Christmas time and there was pristine snow on both sides of the highway. It was very early morning and we had just woken up. We were in pajamas and odds and ends of clothing. My brother Chase was wearing his coat and a pair of sweatpants. Ross only wore a pair of sweatpants and I had a pair of corduroy pants, socks and a t-shirt. My mum had opened the bag of M&Ms that had been sitting between her and my dad while they were driving down the road, periodically handing us back handfuls of bright candy. I had climbed up to the middle seat when my brother's car seat was slid in while he went to the back to sit with Russ. Since I was in the middle, I had to give candy to my two younger brothers. It was odd because the candy coating was melting, leaving yellow and green smears all over my hands. It was the 80s and we weren't wearing seatbelts. My mom had just finished feeding Braden and set him back in the car seat, not bothering to buckle him up either. It's important to note that my brother Chase did not talk a lot. In fact, he only spoke when he really wanted to, which was quite rare. And this made all of the situation so much more shocking. We were rolling along in relative silence when my brother Chase yelled out, fire. Everyone in the car quickly turned to see the orange and yellow flames in the back window. My mother quickly turned to my dad and quietly said, Kevin, we're on fire. My dad started tapping the brakes to slow down, turned on his turn signal and tried to get us out of the right lane to the left lane so that we could stop. He looked at my mum, and I remember him saying in a hushed voice, no brakes. At this point, other cars had began to slow down with us and had started to honk on their horns to get our attention to let us know we were on fire. My dad continued into the left lane and nudged the guardrail, which startled us all. He was using it to help us slow down since our brakes had long since burnt off and were probably laying in the middle of the highway somewhere. We had slowed down some, but were not slowing down enough. 
In my mum's mind, she saw us all perishing. She made a decision that to this day still shocks me. She opened her car door and leapt out. All of a sudden, my mum was gone. I couldn't see her. And then the sliding door opened with a fierce crack. It promptly fell off and hit the road. My mum, being the superwoman that she was, leapt over the top of the door and continued to run alongside the van. The woman was running next to a moving, flaming vehicle. As we slowed down, the flames had become much higher. Now they were starting to encircle the van. They had slowly crept up from the back window around to the sides where the sliding door was and were almost at the front doors. My mum was faced with a wall of fire between her and her children. She later told us that she couldn't see much through the flames. What she did see were the bright colours of Chase's coat. She reached through the flames and grabbed my little brother and pulled him out. She then threw him on the side of the road. He bumped and skidded along the soft shoulder of gravel. And a few moments later, my dad was able to get the car stopped by bumping the guardrail. And now that my mum's door was shut because of the guardrail, and the wall of fire that I saw out the sliding door, I had no way out. My dad threw open his door, and I saw my chance. I grabbed his broad shoulders and hung on for dear life. As he jumped out the van, he inadvertently dragged me along with him, pulling me over his seat. Boy, was I lucky. When he ran around to the side of the van, I slid off of him. I looked for my mum and saw her running down the mountain. I climbed over the guardrail and began to run to her and yell for her. And she turned and yelled at me to run. I started down the steep hill of the mountain. It was freezing. The snow had dug one of my socks off my foot. I stopped to look for my sock. And that is when I saw my mum saw me and yell again for me to keep running. She stopped and waited for me. When I got to her, she grabbed me and continued to run as fast as she could. I was cold, but she said it didn't matter. Little did I know that my dad had gone in to rescue my two other brothers. When he reached the side of the van where the sliding door had been, he was met with the same thing my mum was, a wall of fire. He knew that Brayden's car seat was just beyond the flames. He reached out and grabbed my infant brother as the fire engulfed his car seat. My brother Russ had made it from the back seat to the middle and then to the front seats. And my dad told him to jump as the flames overtook the van. Turning to make his escape and jump over the guardrail, my dad reached behind for my brother. To his surprise and horror, my brother wasn't there. He turned and saw my brother still standing between the two front seats. So he did what any dad would. He reached through the fire once again and grabbed my brother by the back of his sweatpants. He yanked him out, threw him over the shoulder, quickly turning and putting one leg over the guardrail to make a dash for safety. The van exploded. The force knocked my dad over the rail and put him and my two brothers in the snow. He was able to keep hold of his sons and run. The van proceeded to explode twice more. As my mum and me went further down the mountain, she was able to see what was happening. When we eventually heard the boom, she shielded mine and my brother's tiny frames with her body. Eventually, we all met up on the side of the road. There was a nice older lady waiting for us with a blanket. She took me, Russ and Chase and put us in her car with the heat on full blast. When the door shut, Russ turned to us and said, Look. He opened his hands and had showed us a melted mess of green, yellow and orange candy. They'd melted. Fire trucks and ambulances showed up. My mum was trying to hush Brayden, but the heat had been so intense that it had dried up her milk and she couldn't feed him. The firemen gave us colouring books and oxygen. At the hospital, we were all examined. I only had a small scratch from the snow. Russ was treated for smoke inhalation. His blonde hair was now so matted and an orange colour from the heat and flames. My dad had no hair on either arm and no eyebrows and was treated for smoke inhalation also. My mum's arm was hairless. Her milk was dry, but she was fine. Chase had some road rash from my mum getting him out of the way. Poor Brayden, he had it the worst. While my dad had been trying to get him out, there must have been a flame or some hot metal that he touched. He had been burnt so badly. 30 years on, fortunately, he has no scars or any lasting damage. We really should have all perished. There are a lot of ifs or buts, but the important thing is we're alive. 
My parents are heroes. They saved not one, but four kids under the age of seven. They literally went through fire for us, risked life and limb, and that is pure love. That is family. The cause of the fire was a dime sized hole in the gas tank. The mechanics had fixed everything but that. 30 years later, I'm still afraid to get into any red minivans. This all happened a few months ago. My friend had heard that the northern lights might be visible in our area and asked if I wanted to go for a drive out into the country to see if we could catch a glimpse. So we headed out after dark and drove for a while, putting the city behind us and winding out into the countryside, all while scanning the skies and just searching for a good vantage point where the stars and the lights might be visible. But several hours passed and with nothing to show for our efforts, we started to give up on seeing the lights altogether. As we discussed what to do next at that point, my friend noticed that we were closer to her hometown and reminded me that she had been wanting to visit the local cemetery to find the graves of some of her distant relatives. She had been researching her genealogy. It was a clear and warm night and we were both pretty disappointed that we hadn't seen the lights, but both wanted to make the trip worthwhile. So we agreed to swing by the cemetery. We pulled into the dirt road adjacent to it and walked around until we found the right graves. She took some photos and we decided to just wander around for a little bit. My friend was leading the way, using the flashlight on her phone to light the path and to ensure that we didn't accidentally step on any of the graves. I had been feeling increasingly anxious since we arrived which struck me as a bit odd. I have done several cemetery seriation projects as an archaeologist and normally don't feel nervous in them even at night. In fact, I usually find them quite peaceful and calming, but I really felt strange in that particular graveyard and found myself frequently spinning around because I felt like someone was standing behind me. I just chalked it up to general anxiety and tried not to dwell on it. One of the problems with having an anxiety disorder is that it's sometimes hard to tell when your nervousness is justified. Even in retrospect, I don't know if my anxiety was just in my head or if it was related to what would happen next. After wandering for a while, we realized it was approaching 1am and that we should probably get back home. We turned back and headed towards the car. My friend's car was in sight and she was a few yards ahead of me when it happened. I suddenly got a wave of that nervous feeling again and thought that I heard someone running up behind me. I was starting to turn my head to look back when I felt something collide with my back. The initial impact hitting me right between my shoulder blades there was substantial weight behind it, as if someone had actually hurled something into me. The impact was so forceful that I was thrown forwards and fell flat on my face, and as I scrambled to get back up, I felt the weight pressing into my shoulders again and was shoved back down. I then glanced up to see my friend running towards me. She had also heard someone running up to us, had heard my initial fall, and had turned around just in time to see me being pushed back down. She would later tell me that she had seen my sweatshirt flattening against my back and shifting, as if someone had been pressing their back against my shoulders. She grabbed my arm to pull me up just as the weight disappeared, and we both bolted to the car, jumping in and instinctively locking the doors. She wasted no time starting the engine and then hastily peeled out of the driveway. As soon as we hit the main road, we just sped away from there as quickly as possible. We drove for several minutes without saying a word. I think we were both stunned and more than anything confused. She finally glanced at me and said, 
what the hell just happened? I don't quite know how to answer that. I told her that someone had shoved me to the ground, and she said, I know, I saw, but what was that? There was nothing there. We tried to come up with a rational explanation, but none of them made any sense. Had someone ambushed me and then bolted? Definitely not, we would have seen them. Had I tripped? No, I had definitely felt something pushing me, and my friend had seen me being shoved back down. Had it been the wind? Not possible. There hadn't been so much as a breeze that night, and if there had been some freak gust of wind, it would have hit my friend too. Perhaps an animal had attacked me, but that didn't seem possible either. There were no local large animals, big enough or strong enough and stealthy enough to topple a fully grown human without being seen. I had been in full view of my friend, illuminated by her flashlight during the second fall, and the weight had remained at my shoulders even as she was coming right up to me. She should have been able to see whatever had been pushing me. If nothing else, an animal would have cast visible shadows beneath the glare of her flashlight. But there was nothing. We couldn't explain it. Whatever had pushed me twice, it had not been visible to us. As the adrenaline faded, I noticed something else. My back hurt, right between my shoulder blades, right where I had felt the impact. I could feel a sort of stinging prickly sensation. It just felt like my back, despite being covered by my sweatshirt, had somehow been brushed with stinging nettles. I mentioned this to my friend, and she insisted on pulling over the side of the road to look at my back. She switched the hood light on in the car, and pulled the collar of my hoodie down to look. I heard her murmur, what the hell? She took a photo of my back and showed it to me. The skin between my shoulder blades was reddened, and several little blisters had started to appear. In the days that followed, the blisters would later swell up and pop. It was as if I had somehow gotten a sunburn or a bad chemical burn. There weren't any scratches or cuts. There were no opened wounds, no blood. It was a relatively subtle mark, but it was clearly there and it baffled us. We certainly could not figure out how I'd been burned. I hadn't rubbed against anything. I couldn't have touched anything with my back. I was wearing a hoodie all night, and there were no tears or marks on the fabric, and the burn hurt. It continued to sting for several days. I couldn't sleep that night. My back hurt, and every time I started to drift off, I'd suddenly begin to fear that someone was standing over my shoulder and I would startle awake. I couldn't really understand what had happened at the cemetery, but it truly rattled me. I don't know where exactly I stand on the issue of paranormal phenomena. To be honest, as an anthropologist, I'm trained to keep an open mind, but I still have to rely on a deeply academic and often empirical perspective. Still, I know that something truly bizarre and frightening happened that night, and my inability to explain it, to account for every strange little detail has been deeply disturbing. It's also been especially difficult to grapple with because I already have PTSD from a previous assault, and there is something profoundly unsettling about the fact that in this instance, there is nothing I could have done to defend myself, and with no clear explanation for it. There is no way for me to prevent something like this from happening again and I can't cope with a fear that I cannot begin to understand. It's also begun to affect my dreams. I've had several odd nightmares since the incident in the cemetery, dreams that are oddly similar to the nightmares that I've had for many years while growing up. I don't know where they came from, but for as long as I can remember, I've had dreams in which a creature is attempting to lure me one way or another, and in the dreams I usually understand this creature to be a demon. Put simply, sometimes evil, something dangerous, like the entity in the graveyard, is difficult to understand. These dreams have become suddenly relevant again, as I seem to have them nearly every time I fall asleep these days. Sometimes the menacing creature in my dreams takes the form of an old hag. 
In a dream I had when I was 13, I was wandering through a forest. I came across a little cottage with this old woman wandering by the porch. She beckoned me inside and I requested. We spent some time casually talking and baking, but I felt uneasy around her and got the sense that she wanted something from me. We stayed only in the kitchen through the dream, but I recall glancing at the doorway to other rooms and seeing nothing but shadowy edges. I thought that perhaps I should try and leave, but can't remember how to find my way out. At one point, as we sat on the kitchen table, I glanced out the window and noticed a group of people standing in the yard, calling out to the old woman. I asked who they were and she told me, they want me to take them in, but I don't want them, I want you. In other dreams, it had been a more sinister appearance, but I always recognized it as the same creature. I sometimes have dreams where it's sitting in the dark next to the bedside table, whispering to me. It has a shadowy appearance with long lanky limbs and empty eye sockets, teeth made of razor wire, and blood or wine gleaming on its lips. In those dreams, I can hear it whispering, but can't understand what it's saying. Sometimes I have the dreams of it sitting in the chair in the corner of my room, eating rotten apple. I have long suspected this creature is some manifestation of my deepest and most troubling fears. I know these are just dreams, but I mention it because those dreams had subsided in my early 20s. But the incident at the cemetery rattled me so much they returned. It seems to have shaken my understanding of the world around me, opening the floodgates to my own inner demons. In these new dreams, that creature is standing upright behind me in the cemetery. Time seems to be slowing down, and I can sense my friend frozen ahead of me as the creature is whispering at my back. I don't really know why my mind is conflating that dream creature with my encounter in the cemetery, but then fear has increasingly kept me up at night. I have no idea what happened. My friend believes it was a ghost, but I just don't know. I really don't know what to think. I'm 20 years old and a front desk agent at a mid-range hotel in a small East Coast city. I'm a full-time student at the university and live alone in a one-bedroom apartment in a neighborhood made up mostly of college students. At the hotel, I've had to deal with a fair amount of unpleasant or creepy people. Since a young woman in a customer service job seems like an easy target. I was used to old ladies yelling at me or inappropriately aged men making remarks on my appearance. Like, you just have the most adorable smile. I bet you're a heartbreaker. And I've usually been able to deflect. When I work on weekdays, I'm always on the 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift where we handled check-ins. It was a slow night where we only had 28 check-ins to deal with. And by 8 p.m., my coworker Mindy and I had done all our tasks and were leaning over the front desk chatting and watching the news, which blared perpetually from the TV in the lobby's breakfast area. We only had a handful of check-ins left, so we had kicked back with our deck of cards and Chinese takeout all over the desk. A younger man checked in, and I remember thinking he was cutish, but definitely looked Republican. He had neat blonde hair and a boyish smile, a weak chin, and was wearing khakis and a quarter zip fleece. We had a pretty regular interaction, save for him making a lot of eye contact and smiling. And he went to his room. About half an hour later, he came back down and asked us where he could get alcohol. We told him there was a convenience store across the street that had beer and wine, and he and I joked a little about how it was closing soon so he'd better run there. When he came back, he slid a 40 ounce across the desk towards me. With my customer service smile of vague cluelessness, I said, what's this? It's for you. He leaned against the desk. Front desk agents have to stand up, so the top tier of the desk was about chest height. And when he leaned over, he was right in my face. 
Oh, I can't drink that right now, but thank you. I think you should be the one to enjoy that. He was insistent, and I agreed I would take a drink after work. And I went into the office and put it with Mindy's stuff. She'd appreciate the free alcohol, but I didn't feel good about drinking a 40 from some too friendly guy. He hung around the desk for a while, and Mindy is the type of person who can keep someone talking for hours, even if they don't want to, because her brain never runs out of content, and she treats everyone like she's known them for years. This meant that this guy, Mr. Hansen, wasn't leaving anytime soon. They were talking about politics, and I heard him throw around some vaguely conversive rhetoric, but I pretended to be engrossed in my homework. He kept glancing over at me and trying to smile, but it was getting late, my feet hurt, and all I wanted to do was to go home in my underwear, roll a spliff with my cats, instead of allowing some 35 year old, he could flirt with me. At one point, Mindy had to make a phone call. So he slid down the desk towards me. I put on my customer service smile. So, go to a liberal arts college? My uniform shirt was short sleeved, so you could see a few tattoos on my arm, and I have a nose piercing. So I assumed that the music theory homework I was doing on him informed his guess. Oh no, I go to the local university. The city's main attraction besides its hippies and breweries was my college, and a pretty good state school. So it was surprising he didn't assume I went there instead. He was sizing me up, and I prayed that Mindy would be done with her phone call soon, but it was her long distance boyfriend, and she wandered into the back office to talk to him. He started talking about his experience in his southern university, and how he was a veteran, but got injured so he lived off pension or something and didn't work, and was just touring New England right now. The conversation somehow turned to his love life, but I'm pretty sure I was so spaced out by that point, thinking about how I was going to eat at least an entire frozen pizza when I get home, that I didn't pay attention to what he was saying, until it was clear he had asked me a question. Would you do that? He asked. Would I do what? Get freaked out because I don't work? A lot of the chicks I date think that's weird. I remember exactly what he said, because I thought it was weird he called girls chicks, and how he spat it out. I laughed nervously and said, I don't know, I don't think so. The hotel was on the smaller side, and I was very aware of the fact that Mindy and I were the only employees in the building at that time. He began to ask me probing questions about my love life, along the lines of, are you single? No. Would you like him if he moved away? Do you think you'll be with him a long time? The last question freaked me out, and I wished I'd asked him to stop asking me personal questions like that. But I'm polite to a fault even when I'm not working. So I kept smiling and laughing and giving him friendly but impersonal answers. You're very warm, he told me. Have you ever worked with kids? He talked a lot about how the girls he dated back wherever he was from, Ohio maybe, are shallow and materialistic, and how I seemed like a down-to-earth kind of girl. I was such a cutie, and did I know about the girl next door troop? I'm like the girl next door, but cool, he told me. I imagine he was referring to my tattoos again, and at this point, I was physically queasy and uncomfortable, but couldn't disengage. Guest reviews are hugely important in the hospitality business, so at this hotel, we're strictly trained to let guests treat you however they want. You just can't upset them. It probably would have been reasonable at this point to ask him to leave the front desk, but I felt so hopeless and being assertive with people at work is so against my instinct that it didn't even cross my mind to say anything. Because of this, I had to stay there listening to this guy and politely accepting compliments. I assumed he typically got away with it, since he was attractive and clean cut with a slight baby face. I kept praying for the phone to ring and for someone to ask me to perform some sort of complicated and long task, so I could get away. 
but the only time it did was when a neighbouring hotel called to ask if we had printing. Mindy was on the phone in the back until eventually Sam, our night auditor, arrived. And I realised that this guy had monopolised the entire last two hours of my shift, trying to get me to sleep with him and or admit I secretly supported Trump. Hoping Mr Hansen would take this as his cue to leave, I went into the office and got my coat and backpack. When I came back out to witness Sam count the draw, Mr Hansen was still standing there. Well, I hope you have a good night, I said to him. Are you walking out this way? He gestured down the hall which led to all the rooms, as well as the door to the back parking lot. I told him I parked out front, which thankfully was true, and was able to get into my car successfully. I sat there for a while responding to the text that had piled up on my phone while Mr Hansen was diverting my attention. It was about a 10 minute drive from the hotel to my apartment downtown, and I noticed that a car was pulling out of the parking lot at the same time I was. It wasn't Mindy's car, she always stayed an extra half hour or so after her shift technically ended, but there was another hotel next door, so I assumed it was an employee or guest there. I wasn't too concerned when the Nissan was right behind me, but I noticed it had Florida plates, which a lot of rental cars around here do. I take a weird way to get across town, which involves cutting through the University Hospital's enormous and needlessly complicated parking lot, which spans about three blocks. It wasn't necessarily a quicker route, but I liked how there were never any cars there this time of night, and I could go as fast as I wanted in a Subaru Outback. The parking lot, as I said, is needlessly complex, which means stoplights, which all turn into blinking yellows after 9pm, medians and grassy areas placed seemingly at random, and a lot of twists and turns which all go to specific buildings and exits. I'm explaining this parking lot in so much detail to express how strange it was that this rental car was following me this pretty nonsensical route. It was not a way that any kind of map app would take you, since there are more straightforward streets surrounding the parking lot. I initially assumed it was someone going to the hospital, since it was the only major medical facility in a 100 mile radius, and the only well funded one in a larger area. A lot of the people and their families who stayed at the hotel were going there for the hospital. So the momentary explanation I gave myself seemed feasible. It was maintaining a polite distance, but was one of those cars with the ultra bright LED headlamps, which were blinding my mirrors. So the car was impossible to ignore. It followed me around each point, And at one point, just to see, I went in a big circle around the south half of the lot. Sure enough, the car made the exact same circle. My explanation, which was already crumbling, dissolved completely when I drove past the entrance to both the main hospital and the emergency room. Steady consumption of crime shows, scary movies, and true crime Reddit pages and podcasts have made me a very paranoid person. So at that point, I picked up that something was probably wrong. I figured I should avoid going back to my real apartment especially since it was just begging to be broken into with a lot of windows and a very old front door that opens directly to the outside. Obviously, at this point, I was relatively certain it was Mr. Hansen. Like I said, I had had guests cross the line before, making me come out from behind the desk to hug them, touching me when I'm straightening up the lobby, asking the front desk to bring up a towel and answering the door in various states of undress, but I had never been followed or particularly fixated on. A hotel receptionist, even if they're good looking, is someone you have a few brief and pleasant interactions with, but you don't really think about them when they're not there. I decided my best bet would be to get back to the hotel. I looped back through town, the Nissan following at a polite distance, and I'll reiterate how he was trying to be discreet as he could keeping as far behind as possible while still maintaining me within sight. He wasn't trying to intimidate me so much. 
maybe monitor me. Whatever his reasons, I was still afraid. I abandoned the use of turn signals and sped back to the hotel, calling the hotel along the way and asking Sam if he and possibly the security guard we contracted to patrol the property after 11pm could meet me at the front door. When I arrive back at the hotel, I pull around to the front where Sam and the security guard were standing under the awning, while the Nissan hit the gas to the back lot. I explained the situation and the security guard went out the back door to look for the car and its driver. When he returned, he said he spoke to a peppy blonde guy outside who was coming in. He said he had just been out to smoke a cigarette and was now returning to his room. Security asked him if he had seen a Nissan with Florida plates and he said he hasn't. There wasn't much more we could do at that point. Luckily, I wouldn't be working for a few days after Mr. Hansen was set to check out. And we were fully sold out that weekend, so he couldn't extend his stay if he wanted to. All guests were asked upon check-in to write down make, model, color, and plate of their vehicle on registration card, so just to confirm, I pulled his reg card. Sure enough, the silver Nissan Altima with Florida plates. Here's what he wrote on his TripAdvisor review. Great stay, room was clean, breakfast was hot, and that's all I can ask for, lol. The best thing about this hotel were the staff though. I had a lovely time with the two ladies at the front desk. Natasha especially, a very sweet young girl. Hope to be seeing you sooner rather than later. Mr. Hansen, we won't meet again because my manager put you on the banned list. Around a year, maybe a year and a half ago, I was using an app called Whisper to help me make friends after getting out of high school. I was 19 at the time and had a really nice boyfriend. I had used Whisper before and actually made two to three friends during my senior year and also found a friend of mine's boyfriend cheating using Whisper. So it's safe to say this app can be a handful sometimes. I put out a whisper asking for someone to talk to, and of course I got a ton of replies but couldn't get to all of them, but I messaged some of the more interesting ones back. This guy named Jack started messaging me and seemed really nice. He said he was 23 and lived eight minutes from my house. If you used whisper, you'd know that you'd be able to search by area or go into a general section and see thousands of whispers being uploaded that you could reply to. You can also send photos instantly after four messages. As soon as we messaged four times, he sent me a selfie and I was surprised, but didn't really respond to it. Jack was telling me how he worked for a towing company in a neighboring town, how he would have to go use the interstate to go places and all that. At the time, I didn't have a job as my mother was sick. And so I would use my laptop out in the kitchen at the table to watch streams and play some games in case she needs me at any point. I remember watching my friends stream, talking to my friends and generally just having a good time until I got a text from Jack. Now I never gave him my address, never even really explained where I lived. And I did not mention the church, the interstate, nor any landmarks near me. But he texted me saying, Hey, look out your window. I thought maybe something happened on the interstate, but then I remembered I never told him how close it was to me. But I assumed maybe he just guessed I lived nearby. I see a tow truck right outside my house with a car that broke down. My blood ran cold. He was at the truck waving. Also very inappropriate while working, but that's besides the point. I started shaking. Due to having some bad anxiety, I ended up having an anxiety attack. How did he know where I lived? I replied by asking that exact same question, and he said, Well, you're home, aren't you? I didn't respond. I went back to the stream I had up and started typing to my friends, freaking out to them and causing them to panic as well. I didn't want to call the cops because my cousin is one. And so is one of my friends. As soon as anything was heard about it, I thought I'd be in deep trouble for it. So I ignored him. Then he sent me a picture of his member 
on the app. I was disgusted. I deleted the post and messages from Whisper and blocked him. The next day, an unknown number messaged me. I figured it was him. I ignored it. And then I got a restricted phone call and answered. Big mistake. I was out in the garage with my cat. And this voice on the other end said, Hey, you look so sexy right now. Wanna go for ice cream down the road? I looked out the door that was next to me. And I see him in his car driving slowly, keeping his eyes locked on me. I jumped up and ran inside after hanging up running to my room so I could feel comforted by my blankets in bed. I was petrified. I got a job soon after that at Subway, and he would come in and start harassing me, texting me on random numbers since I would block them all, and I felt paranoid all the time, knowing he seemed to know where I was at all times. One day, my now ex-boyfriend ended up texting him, as I had given him his original number that I had just in case anything happened since I blocked it. Furiously telling him to leave me alone, stop talking to me and everything. I never got a message back after that, but I'm still paranoid he's watching me. So Jack, let's not meet. I used to date a girl in college who lived three hours away. We would trade weekends, one at her school, one at mine. One day she got upset because she had driven all the way to see me, and I was in an all-night study session which she had known about and couldn't be home to see her. She texted me that she was going back to her place and I never heard anything from her again. After three days of texting her trying to make sure she was okay, her messages started coming back as number not found. I sent her the stuff she'd left at my apartment in the mail, and it returned as no forwarding address. Her instant messenger account, which I had never messaged but knew the name of, disconnected. And it gets weirder. I called her apartment landline and was told the people who had lived there had moved out. She had three roommates and didn't leave a number as to where they went. I got really freaked out and asked friends who worked in school admin to pull some strings, just to make sure she was alive. The school she was at didn't have any record of her as a student. The license plate to her car wasn't registered to anyone. None of our mutual friends ever saw her again. And I called the police, but there were no car accidents involving anyone who fit her description in the stretch of road between our two schools that night, or in the two weeks that followed. I didn't ask for a longer time frame because at that point, she was already missing. Cops wouldn't file a missing person report because I wasn't a family member. To this day, I have no idea what happened. Why she freaked out on me so bad, or if she's still alive, or in witness protection, or was erased from all time by an evil wizard. She literally vanished without a trace. I was around 9 to 10 years old and the oldest of two siblings. One night I heard my sister of two crying, which woke me up from a nightmare that my mum was being taken to a hospital, bleeding. After a minute of her being seriously loud, I got up to check on her and realized my brother, who was four, probably snuck in bed with me. So I moved out without waking him to check on my sister who wasn't in her crib. Now that freaked me out. I turned on all the lights and started to scream her name. And both my sister and my brother came out from my room. They both had a nightmare and decided to sleep with me. I tell them to go back to my room and go check on our parents who aren't home. Now I pretend everything is okay because I don't want two little children crying while I don't know why we're at home alone at 4am. My grandmother showed up almost an hour later and told us our mum had had a migraine and had to go to the hospital and she was staying with us for a while. Years later, I found out it wasn't a migraine my mother had, but a miscarriage. I have no explanation for what happened that night.
This happened a while ago, 2013. I used to be able to astral project through meditation. I never really had any control of where I traveled. I would just automatically end up where I did. I would always end up in a barren forest in the dead of winter. Everything covered in almost a foot of snow. I only traveled there two times without any incidents. I would just wander around a while before coming back to my body. Then I encountered the creature that stopped me from ever going back. The third time I traveled to the forest, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I wandered around a bit walking in a random direction. I stopped for a minute and looked around. I spotted a dark shape about six or seven feet away from me. It was this pure black wolf staring right at me. I wasn't afraid for whatever reason. And the wolf turned and started walking away from me, but stopped after walking about a foot. It looked back at me, as if beckoning me to follow it, and follow the wolf I did. I followed the wolf for what felt like 20 minutes. It led me to a clearing in the woods I had never been to before. As soon as I stepped into the clearing, the wolf ran back into the woods. I watched it run off and then looked around the clearing. The atmosphere, which had felt completely normal up until this point, shifted once I saw what was standing on the other end of the clearing. It was like a pressure pushing me down. The air itself felt heavy. What was standing on the other end of the clearing was a tall humanoid creature. Its skin appeared black, pitch black. It had cloven hooves for feet, but no fur on its body. Its body was incredibly thin, to the point of being able to see its ribs. Its arms were abnormally long. Its hands ended in long talons. It had these crooked, jutting horns. I couldn't for some reason make out any facial features except for its eyes. They were bright, glowing red. I was terrified and stood there for what felt like a minute or so. This creature and I were just staring at each other before I snapped back to my body. After I returned to my body, I felt like I was out of breath and couldn't stop trembling for a good while. I was understandably pretty shaken up. I tried for some research, but Google wasn't yielding the answers I was looking for. I spoke with a few acquaintances who supposedly had more experience and knowledge in these matters than I did, and got some advice, which looking back now on the events that happened, was not very good advice. A few weeks after my initial encounter, I decided to return to the forest. Before going back, I formed a salt circle around myself as I was advised, as a protective measure. I entered my meditative state and found myself back in the forest more specifically, but in the clearing, where I had the first encounter with the creature. Immediately, I felt the pressure and heaviness in the air, only this time it was worse. My back was turned away from the clearing, facing the trees. I could feel the presence of the creature right behind me. Remembering the advice that was given to me, I summoned as much resolve and courage as I could, and made what I know now was a huge mistake. I spoke to it, trying to keep my voice as steady and commanding as I could. Despite being terrified, I said, You have no power over me. Silence stretched for what was probably only a few minutes, as I waited for something to happen, or a response of some kind. What I didn't expect to happen was that the creature reached out and touched me. Have you ever been burned badly? I once burnt part of my hand with an iron once, and that was the closest thing I can compare the sensation to. The creature grabbed my neck, its talon hand encompassing the whole of my neck. It hurt so much I couldn't even find it within myself to scream. The next thing I knew, I was back in my body, still feeling a slight burn in my neck, but only a phantom of what I felt before. There were no marks left behind, just the memory of the feeling. I tried to put the experiences from my mind, just forget all about it and go about my life. After all, I had a part-time job and community college classes to worry about. Everything seemed normal. 
until about a week later. Going about by day, I would catch small glimpses of the creature for mere split seconds. I was of course alarmed, and my distress only became worse when I came to a horrifying realization. Each time I caught a glimpse, the creature would be ever so slightly closer. I tried to once again find answers to what happened through internet searches, but found nothing that appeared helpful, nor could tell me what I was dealing with. After a few days of dealing with this, things got even worse, as they usually do. I began to hear whispers as if they were coming from inside my head. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying, but it unnerved me greatly. As the creature grew slowly closer, the whispers grew louder. In desperation for help, I turned to my mother. My mother is a religious woman, and after I explained everything that had happened, and was happening, she was extremely concerned. She immediately called the pastor of her church who came to the house, with the church's youth pastor as well. They prayed over me, spoke to me about spiritual warfare, because they assumed what I was dealing with was a demonic being. After the visit from the pastor, I did stop seeing the creature, but the whispers grew in volume, and took a very aggressive tone. It began to wear on me, and my sanity. My partner at the time claimed to know what the creature was and how to stop its influence in my life. I'm desperate to try anything to rid myself of this being, so I went along with what he said. I won't provide details about the ritual we performed as it was dangerous, and I don't want anyone attempting such a thing. But it evidently worked. It's been about seven years since all of this happened, and I haven't seen, dreamt, nor felt the creature's presence or influence in my life since. Moral of the story, please be careful when you astral project. I live in New Orleans, and years ago, my brother wanted to adopt a dog from a small rural town about two hours away. It was an easy enough drive, but we got close to the town of Clinton, and I started noticing a ton of police driving around. No sirens, nobody speeding by, but I think I probably saw 15 to 20 patrol cars in the span of about 10 minutes. We get to the house, meet the foster mum and the dog, who is the sweetest thing in the world, and decide to adopt her and head home about two hours later. Everything seems fine. Tally, the dog, climbs up in the front seat while I'm driving and falls asleep, leaving my brother to sit in the back by himself, which was hilarious. We keep driving and notice that there are even more cops driving around, but still no sirens. They're just everywhere though. As we're leaving Clinton, maybe about three miles or so to the exit, I notice this old white sedan coming flying up on our rear, flashing their lights and honking. I didn't really think about it, but I figured maybe these people were hurt or needed something. It definitely wasn't a cop car, but it was unusual for sure. I started to pull over to the shoulder, and they pulled over as well, about 10 to 15 yards behind us when they stopped. I stopped the car and when I turned around, I looked at my brother. For some reason, as soon as our eyes met, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and I realized there was something very wrong about this. I hesitated, wanting to see if someone needed help. But as soon as the door of the car behind us opened, a voice in my head said to get the hell out of there. I peeled out, sped for the exit, making sure nobody had followed us, and we got back to New Orleans safe and sound. But the entire time I was watching for that car to ensure they didn't follow. I never learned what happened with all the police cars or the white sedan, but something was really wrong. I should have listened to my gut way sooner. Stopping even temporarily was really stupid of me. I hypothesize that there was some kind of raid or something, and the cops were looking for someone as we were driving through. The white sedan was trying to get us to pull over so they could carjack us and dodge the cops further. I don't know though, 
and I hoped that it was someone innocent that needed help and I just bailed. But I don't know. I have a pretty strong feeling, as does my brother, that there was something funky going on. My father, my brother and I have always been believers in the paranormal. And throughout our lives, we've all had our own experiences. One of our favourite bonding activities when we got bored was to go out to one of the local graveyards and hunt ghosts. We always carried an EMF meter, a decent camera, a big honking railroad lantern from my dad's days in Union Pacific, and a phone with an audio recording app. One night, I had a friend visiting from Pennsylvania, and we decided to go a hunting. We had come up empty handed the first few minutes, although our flashlight and our camera seemed to be losing power quite fast. Then a pack of coyotes, probably at least half a mile away got riled up and started howling. This was not uncommon since we lived in rural Nebraska. But my friend is a very high strung guy and lives in Pennsylvania Metro. So the coyotes gave him the creepy crawlies. Suddenly something that was clearly not a coyote let out a massive cry. I'm not a zoologist, but it sounded far too low to be a wolf howl, and far too loud and primal to be someone's sheepdog. I turn to my friend with a big grin and say, that sounds bigger than a coyote. This is the last straw for him. And so me and my brother walk him back to our truck while my dad is off in the other end of the cemetery. My brother and I start walking back to where my dad is. And when he comes sprinting through the headstones panting, he said he was walking along when he suddenly saw a bright light like a camera flash. He brought his camera up and said, Are you kidding me? And snapped a shot. My first and immediate thought was cigarette smoke. But my dad had quit smoking only a few weeks ago. Our grandpa had passed from lung cancer when we were young, and my dad and my brother had both been in tears when we begged him to stop smoking. My brother had kept tabs to make sure he didn't relapse. The picture isn't great quality, and it's far easier to analyze in full resolution. My dad is convinced that the wisp to the left is the arm of the apparition reaching for him, and the head and torso are on the right. Even when we aren't with him, my dad goes out on his own. He has a job as a night shift trucking dispatcher. And when he's bored, he'd use his brakes to walk a graveyard and record EVPs. He never caught much of anything until one day he found a fresh grave. It was a rain termant. And he started reading off the gravestone and asking why it was so fresh. He mispronounced the woman's last name and quickly corrected himself. It was only later when we listened to the audio that we heard an annoyed mumbling in the background after he mispronounced her name. It definitely had an I'd like to speak to a manager kind of quality. He was alone in a prairie graveyard at 3am with hardly even a gust of wind. The only explanation is that someone was very annoyed he couldn't get their name right. The most exciting of my dad's graveyard adventures though, was that one time that something followed him home. This happened primarily to my mum. I'm a 19 year old female who was studying in a university in England, entering my second year last month. We decided to stay in my university town the day before I was due to move into my student home so I could get there early and move my stuff in and give me the rest of the day to relax before we started freshers week. The night before moving day, me and my mother stayed in a local hotel in my university town. and were greeted by a friendly guy called Jeremy. Jeremy was very attentive and showed us to our rooms and stayed around 10 minutes telling us the history of the hotel and repeatedly asked us if we needed help unpacking and stuff, which we kindly rejected. It was a Friday, so me and my mother went around the town and had a few drinks. 
Nothing too heavy as fresh as we'd started the next day. So I wanted to be fresh for Saturday night. Before going out, Jeremy explained that he never works weekends. So told us to have a good night and wished me luck with the rest of my university journey. He gave me and my mother a hug each and a slight kiss before moving his hand down towards her bum, which she found weird, but brushed it off as nothing. My mum is 37, but looks young for her age, and Jeremy is easily in his 40s. So we just thought Jeremy may have fancied her chances with her. Moving on. Me and my mum have a great night around the town, and watch a few live bands and have a few wines, so we're a bit on the tipsy side. We get back to the hotel and the bar is still open. So we decided to have a nightcap. While we're having a drink in the bar, Jeremy emerges from a back room and spots us and makes a couple of jokes. He then proceeds to watch a video on his phone at full volume of a woman screaming at the top of her lungs as if her life was being ended. This screaming was blood curdling and made me and my mum unsettled and also Another couple in the bar looked a little concerned as well. The video lasted three to four minutes before Jeremy laughed and went into the bag. When we start making our way, my mum had taken her shoes off after they had become painful from all the dancing in the bars earlier. Jeremy emerges from the back room and puts his arms around my mum and says, Oh, let me help you to your room, honey. You must be wasted after all that drink. My mum isn't actually drunk and insists that she's fine. But Jeremy persists and basically follows us to our room and proceeds to come in. But I bid him good night and close the door in his face before locking it. Next morning, we are up early and make our way down for breakfast. The young girl working takes our breakfast orders only for Jeremy to bring them out insisting the eggs are cooked to perfection. Although he claimed he never worked weekends. Me and my mum are weirded out by Jeremy at this point and checked out of the hotel straight after breakfast. Jeremy sees us and says these exact words. I'll be seeing you soon, Christy. Anyway, at the time it doesn't strike us as unusual and my mum drives us to my new home and helps me unpack. Once I'm all ready, she leaves in the early afternoon as she had to work that evening at our local bar. The rest of the day goes without much going on. But that night I'm out drinking with my housemates and I get a call from my mum saying Jeremy had just come to the bar where she works. This is no coincidence as when we're having our nightcap, Jeremy would have heard us talking about the bar where my mum works. And he also had our address which needed to be provided at the hotel for whatever reason. He also said to my mum when she was pouring his pint, that she should go round to his friend's house after her shift, which was just around the corner. This call really scared the crap out of me. A half hour later, mum called me and said that Jeremy had left the bar after she rejected his offer to go to his friend's house later. But Jeremy had said he'd be back for her. This was really worrying and I told her to make sure that a customer was always with her when she was locking up on her own that evening. After this call, I felt sick and didn't join my friends in going to the nightclubs. In the meantime, I called my dad who no longer speaks to my mum. They're not on bad terms. They just chose not to keep in touch with each other after they split a few years ago. My dad is a club bouncer, but he wasn't on duty that night. And I called him and begged him to drive down there and make sure everything was okay. My dad clearly knew by my shaky voice that I was panicked, scared and helpless. 1am rolled around and I didn't get a response from either my mum or my dad's phone. I was worried sick and hoped that Jeremy hadn't been waiting around the corner and done something to my mum while she was locking up. At 1.30, my mum finally ran me in hysterics. As she had been locking up, Jeremy had pulled up in his car with three other men and shouted at her to get into the car for a ride. My mum declined his advances and he got out the car and approached her and told her that he won't tell her again. He said she had been flirting and teasing him ever since she checked in last night. She told Jeremy that was nonsense and she wasn't at all into him. 
As Jeremy approached her, she could smell heavy liquor. As Jeremy went to grab her, my dad pulls up behind the car and beeps his horn. This caused Jeremy to go back into the car, climb back in, and tell my mum that he knows where she lives, and he'll be waiting. The car screeches off. My dad gets out of his car and tells her that I had told him to check on her. Scared to go home, she asks my dad to drop her off at my grandmother's as she doesn't want to be alone. After that night, we never saw Jeremy again. But my mum did make a report to the police about him and gave them a full account of what happened, but she hasn't heard back from them. I'm just so relieved that my dad turned up to the pub when he did, as it would have been very easy for Jeremy to get my mum into that car, as she's only five foot two and weighs roughly 120 pounds. I just hope that scumbag got what was coming to him and is behind bars. My mum, as you can imagine, has been pretty affected by this and is only now comfortable being alone in her own home. So Jeremy, let's not meet again. This happened to the late son of a very close family friend. The entire family witnessed this firsthand. Their son was visiting parents after a long while and he brought his wife and daughter along. There were some family celebrations planned and all of their sons and daughters along with their spouses and children were there. Around 1am, the son woke up, cried and asked for his parents. Since it was a full house, everyone gathered around him. He said that angels had visited him in a dream and told him that they would revisit at 4am, then he would die. They all dismissed it as a bad dream. His eldest brother suggested they could go to the ER and get him examined in order to ease his anxiety. They drove out to a nearby hospital and the rest of the family followed them. Doctor smiled at his story, examined him thoroughly, ran an AKG and a few tests. Then he got a pat on the back and was given the all okay verdict. He asked to be retained there until 4am. Doctor said, Okay, you can stay here till 4am if that makes you feel better, but right afterwards you'll have to leave. He was sitting there and talking, when all of a sudden, he passed away. Cardiac arrest. The time? 4am. I'm a guy from the UK. I live in a town in Wales, albeit not the little villages most people imagine. My town is a proper holiday destination along the coast of Wales. This isn't relevant to the story, but I just thought I would give everyone some context. So it started when I was around 15 years old, eight years ago. I was dating a girl from about two towns over. I would usually get the train to hers and back. However, this one night, her family weren't supposed to be home and we were kind of being watched by her brother, who was about 20 and pretty chill. The plan was to stay the night. We were up late playing on the Wii, but her parents unexpectedly came home. I never got along with her mother and the whole thing kind of got heated and I was kicked out the house and told I could not stay over. It was about 2 AM and I didn't want to call my own parents in worry of waking them. My mother, is a very strict woman. So I began the long trudge home. It was roughly an hour and a quarter worth of walking. So I was expecting to be home around half four. So I was walking along the concrete part above the beach. And I stopped after about a half hour of walking. As there is a public toilet, which is kind of run down, but also open 24 hours to those desperate, which I was. I was expecting it to be empty or just have a homeless dude sleeping in it, but I was wrong. There was a guy using the urinal. This guy looked to be in his mid to late fifties, a little on the overweight side, but not morbidly. He had gray, messy-ish hair, but other than that, he looked pretty normal. He definitely didn't look homeless. I remember he made a quick joke about something, but I don't remember what. 
I politely laughed, did my business, and left. After about 15 more minutes of walking, the weather had gotten pretty bad. It started to rain heavily, and the wind was picking up. I seemed to remember this was around November time, so it was pretty cold. I'm walking, and a car drives by, beeps and pulls over just in front of me. I had assumed it was someone I know, but couldn't think who. I got in the car and the dude from the toilets was inside. He asked me where I was heading, and I told him. He said that was a long walk, and I couldn't be expected to walk all that way in this weather, and he offered me a lift. In hindsight, I probably should have refused, but the weather was bad, and at the time, he wasn't giving off any weird vibes. The drive took about 15 minutes, I think, maybe 20. The more I was in the car with him, the more I started to get vibes that there was something off. He was telling me his best friend was a 14 year old lad who stays over at his place a lot and they drink together. And if I ever wanted to join in, I was welcome to. He was asking me some really invasive questions as well. I don't fully remember what they were. I just remember it's not the kind of questions you ask to someone that you're giving a simple lift home to. Anyway, we got to the street around the corner from my place and I asked him to just drop me off there. I told him my house wasn't accessible by the road and that I would just walk the rest of the way home. He gave me his number and told him to ring him when I got back to my house safely as he wanted to make sure I got home okay. I asked him what his name was. At this point, he knew my full name and he just said, Pete. Pete what? My phone wants a surname. He wouldn't tell me. He just kept saying, just Pete. I later found out that Pete was a fake name too. Anyway, I got into my house and texted him just to let him know I was home safe. It was probably a bad decision, but back then I was full of bad decisions. The next day came and I was expecting everything to go back to normal, but it didn't because I stupidly gave Pete my number when I texted him. I started to get texts from him every morning basically just saying good morning and wishing me well. I replied to the first few and then started ignoring them. So that's when he tried calling me every single evening. I would ignore most of his calls, but he would often repeatedly ring until I answer. He was sending me these texts, inviting me over to his house for some drinks, and he kept telling me he just gotten himself a pool table and wanted me to come and play with him. He was telling me a story of a friend he was playing pool with, the 14 year old one I was talking about, and accidentally let slip the guy called him John. I collared him on this and said, I thought your name was Pete. Oh no, my friend's name is John. You just said your friend called you John, and you told me your friend was called Tom. Oh. Well, some people call me John. It's like a nickname. He hesitated saying this too, and it clicked in my mind that he was lying to me. I kept refusing, but he kept asking. After a while, my mum wanted to know who this dude who kept texting me was. I told her, and she rang him herself from her phone and told him that if he carried on texting and ringing me, she would be calling the police. I didn't get any more texts from him after that, but it didn't end there. I had a routine, you see, and he knew it. I always walked my dog at half four every afternoon and played with her for 40 minutes on the field at the end of my street, just near where he had dropped me off. I had started to notice his car pulling up there within five minutes of me getting there with my dog. He had tinted windows, but I would always notice the car lights were on and left on and the engine was always running. I recognized his car and would occasionally notice the car door open and a large flash from that direction as if someone were taking pictures. I started changing the time I walked my dog, but he would eventually figure it out and start showing up either earlier or later to coincide with me walking her. This went on for months. I never mentioned it to anyone, but one day it just stopped. He stopped pulling up on the side of the field 
and I never saw his car again. No text messages or phone calls, it just stopped. I ended up getting a new phone after about a year and had that for another two. I dug out my old empty phone when I was around 18 to 19 after the aforementioned dog passed away. I had some old pictures and videos of her on that phone and wanted to transfer them over to my PC so that I always had them. I turned on the phone, which had been off for several years now, and still had the old SIM card in it. That's when I got my final message from Pete. It was an old one, and was about 14 months old. It said something along the lines of, Hi, I know we haven't spoken in a while, but I've just thought you should know that over New Year's I was diagnosed with an illness, and I've been told I don't have long left. You were such a good friend in the short time we knew each other. I live at, and he sent me his address, and would really appreciate it if you could come around, just so that I could have one last chat. I've got some beers. If you want to stay the night, you can. Just drop me a line if you want to come round, so that I can get everything ready for you. See you soon. No idea if Pete slash John was genuinely ill, or just trying to lure me to his house. I've never been to the address he sent me, and never responded to him or heard from him since. I didn't reply to him, and that was the last I heard from the guy. It certainly had a big impact on me during those years. I don't know if he's gone, but I do know I never would want to meet him again. This happened to my childhood friend, Jean. He was the only son of an immigrant couple. They had him in later years, so he lived a completely sheltered life and had a complete lack of social skills and social development. They had no other family around, only friends, mostly other immigrants from the same country. Jean's father was very well off, but he lived like a miser. So Jean grew up thinking they were middle class bordering on poor. When Jean was in his 30s, his father passed away from an illness. Shortly after that, his mother was tragically struck by a vehicle and killed as she crossed a busy street. Jean was left all alone and in charge of a fortune in assets he was ill prepared to handle. Out of nowhere, a relative from the old country appears. She was young, attractive, and a lady, supposedly a distant cousin. Soon, she was seen with Jean here and there, not too often, but often enough that people began to notice. Three months later, Jean simply vanished. No one knew where he went, why he wasn't around, and now the cousin had control of the fortune. Another friend of the family got concerned and called the local police to report him as a missing person. The guy in charge told the friend to never inquire again about Jean, to better leave this matter alone. No one knows what happened to Jean, but several of us have several guesses. I recently started a job in a factory on swing shift, 4pm to 2am. I'm only two weeks in, but I can say right now that I do not feel safe there. I'm already an unimposing trans guy in a small conservative town, and I'm at the point where it's difficult to be stealthy, aka easy, obvious target. I also made the mistake of telling everyone that I used my preferred name, but didn't correct them on calling me she or her. I figured that correcting them on pronouns would make it even more obvious that I do not belong. Last night was my second night completely on my own, my first week was training on day shift. I got in the car and headed home around 2.15. It was an hour commute and right before I got on the highway, a truck got right up on my bumper and stayed there until I got into a well-lit part of the next city. If I changed lanes, so did he. He kept his brights on the whole time and he disappeared for a bit. And I hoped that he was just being an ass and that was that. I made my way across the city without incident, until I turned off onto the scenic route home from there. This guy comes up quickly behind me out of nowhere, until he's right up on my bumper again. Same deal as earlier. 
right behind, blinding me. I was definitely panicking at this point because no one else is on the road, and I know I'm the only one at work that lives in this town. He follows me for another five miles or so, then suddenly decides to make a sharp U-turn and book it out of there. I drove home as calmly as I could, drove around the police station a bit before finally going home. They didn't follow me the whole way. They must have gotten impatient after that half hour. I couldn't sleep at all, and I do not feel safe going to work after that. I've tried calling human resources, but no one answered the phone. I don't have anyone else's number at work, and at that late at night, our small town police stations aren't even open. Anyone with advice, it would be greatly appreciated. I was in high school, and my mom, who was a teacher, had a conference in another town. My brother and I decided to go with her. We stayed in a hotel where we had stayed before, and there were two beds, and I was with my mom, and my brother was next to us on the other one. I'm not someone who normally gets scared. I can watch scary movies alone at night and fall right to sleep. This night, though, I had this dream. I was at a party with some of my friends and everyone was drinking. We were at an apartment somewhere and on the second floor, suddenly people started screaming. My friend and I asked what was happening and someone told us that some drunk kid was dared to try and jump on the railing of the balcony and he missed and fell off the side. Everyone started going downstairs and then I see him. In my dreams, his face looks like what I can only explain as what a porcelain doll's face would look like if it had fallen and broken in half. There was no blood, just a broken face with one eye that was open. It was the brightest blue I had ever seen, and I walked past him and his eye had followed. Then I woke up. I could hardly breathe and I couldn't move, I was so frightened. I've had nightmares before, and I'm always able to shake them off, but not this one. This one felt too real. Then I noticed that the light in the bathroom of the hotel is flickering. Once I finally get the nerve to move or speak, I wake my mum and tell her about her light. Eventually she gets up, checks it out and fixes it, though I'm still unsure how she did it. Once I'm calm again, I go back to sleep, and for the most part, forget about it until two weeks later. So I'm sitting at the dining room table eating dinner while my mum is reading the paper. I'm only half listening when she starts telling my dad about this sad story in a town not too far from us, where a drunk kid was dared to jump on a balcony railing, missed, and plummeted to his end. This happened about 14 years ago. My boyfriend and I went to a graveyard one night because he told me a story about how he had seen something there. He didn't really want to take me, but I insisted. He said that he had heard stories about the place, and if you go there and sit there every night, you'll eventually see it. He said he had finally seen the thing for himself on the third or fourth consecutive night he visited. It was man-like and grey, but he only caught a glimpse of it and never went back afterwards. I remember him saying he had car trouble when it appeared also. I couldn't resist. I wanted to see it for myself. On the third night, we saw it. We were sitting in the dark, with the moon being our only source of light, and we both suddenly got creeped out for the first time since we'd been visiting. We changed our minds about the whole thing and decided to leave and never return. But lo and behold, my car, that's never had any trouble before or since, wouldn't start. My boyfriend was driving that night and kept trying, and it did eventually start up. When the headlights came on full force, we saw it standing right in front of the car. It was about seven feet tall, and it was grey. In fact, it looked like a moving statue to me. It was kind of bent over just looking into the windshield at us, and we were freaking the hell out. Finally, it kind of shifted and the car started. The thing darted off so quickly. I knew that if it came to the side windows, we'd both be toast. It was so, so fast, but it just stood to the side of the car watching us drive away. 
the cemetery was laid out, where the gravel road went around the whole graveyard in a circle, and looped back around so that the entrance is also the exit. We were spinning tires and slinging gravel the whole way around. But when we passed the place where the thing was, it hadn't moved. It had been standing there watching us go around the circle and let us leave. But it was looking directly at me. And I couldn't really make out any features as it was dark. But I was overcome with the most severe depression I've ever felt in my life in that moment when I was looking back. It was like everyone and everything I cared about in my whole life was burned right before my eyes. The pain and hurt was almost tangible. And it took my breath away in that moment. That night, when I was home and finally able to sleep somehow, I had a dream that the thing was calling me from that graveyard begging me to return. It was harmless and miserable, stuck in that old cemetery forever, and was alone. When I woke up, I was determined to go back and find the creature. But before I could even tell my boyfriend, I got a call from him and two of his best buddies. All three of them had nightmares where the thing had brutally ended their lives and mutilated me. The two girls who called me didn't know anything about the graveyard incident the night before. It was also so late when I got back home, I didn't tell anyone. I just went to bed. My boyfriend dreamt I had gone back to that place because I felt for it. So he drove me out there. And when we got there, he found the thing ripping me apart. For a long time, I had dreams about it saying, I won't hurt you. I'm suffering. And for a while, I had to fight the urge to go back, even after three people told me about their nightmares. The pull isn't strong anymore. I guess it faded with time and kids and adulting. But I do think about it often and do kind of get a little itch just to drive through. And I don't know, it would be dumb as hell. But there's always been a little nagging voice that whispers about the thing we saw that night. It had a masculine physique, but no genitalia. And its eyes were completely black. No iris, no people or anything. Just black inky nothingness. I've been searching all these years, but the only pictures I've ever seen that look remotely like it are Wendigos, but not the ones with fur or antlers, just a greyish humanoid thing. The best way I could describe it, I suppose, would be more like a statue. Does anyone have any idea what this could be? It's bugged me for nearly two decades, and any suggestion would be appreciated. This story starts around the fall of 2017. I was walking back down to work from lunch when I passed this girl and noticed she got up and began to walk behind me. She took a different route and didn't follow me. And a few days later, it happened again. But this time she was following me. I assumed she wasn't following me at the time because where my office building is situated, you have to go up a set of stairs and pass a few other buildings. And she did not follow me into my building. After a while, I noticed we took the same train home. A lot of the time she would be watching me. When we made eye contact, she'd look away. Then she'd continue looking when she thought I wasn't looking. There's a Whole Foods across from my office. I went there for lunch a few times during the week. I started seeing this girl sitting in the window for lunch, and she would almost always get up as soon as I left and walked the way I did. Around this time, I began seeing her more frequently. During lunchtime, or when I got the metro, she was almost always there. After a few months of this, I started noticing that she would get off at the same station as me sometimes. Sometimes she would walk the same way as me. Once I got to my place, she would always pass but never followed me up to the entrance. During this time, I started receiving phone calls at work from random phone numbers that at the time, I assumed were spam. There would either be silence on the end, or the person would hang up immediately. I also started receiving fake Facebook requests from people I already knew, or were already on my friends list. December of 2017 comes by. By this time, I'm not going to Whole Foods as often. 
If she gets off at the same station as me, I go into a restaurant or go shopping for groceries before I go home. Around this time, an old friend I went to high school with contacts me kind of out the blue. She said she wanted to follow me on Instagram. We text a few times and I accepted her follow request. She contacts me again about a month later from a different number. But this time she's texting me frequently. I'm talking about every day slash every other day. I'm not one to be mean or show when I'm annoyed too often. But after months of this, when she starts asking me if she's texting me too frequently, I don't hesitate to tell her that she could lay off a bit. She stops for a week or so then begins texting me frequently again. This whole ordeal should have sent up red flags for several reasons. During this time, she would ask me so many random questions, like when you would do when you're trying to get to know someone. She would ask for selfies, which I declined to as I don't like taking pictures of myself. And I would tell her that there are plenty of pictures of me on Facebook. She would ask what I'm doing on the weekends, and the names of my friends on occasion, which I wouldn't tell her because I thought it was weird that she'd want to know my friends names. I only sent her a couple of videos of fun things I would do but that was it. August 2018 rolls around. I'm still seeing creepy girl everywhere during the week. I get pulled into my boss's office. And he says that a few co workers received fake screenshots from Facebook of me talking badly about them. Now I've never posted on Facebook and would never talk crap about my co workers on social media. I don't have a grudge with anyone, nor do I know of anyone who has a problem with me. I'm a fairly easygoing guy. I managed to clear things up with everyone involved and still had my job. Of course, my friend is still texting me fairly frequently. And I tell her what happened a few days later when I get home from work. I tell her I don't want to go too much into it, but she keeps badgering me for details. When I finally let it spill, I was going to bed and she got the message. The more I thought about all the time she texted me, the more uneasy I got. Something that she said just didn't make sense, especially from the way I remember it. We had kept in touch over the years, just not as frequently. And we hadn't touched bases for a while before I heard from her in December. A couple of weeks later, I decided to reach out to my friend on Instagram. But the Instagram she last messaged me from wasn't there. However, there was still an Instagram for her that I followed and that followed me back. I reached out to her and asked her what a phone number was. The phone number was completely different. And it turns out she was never the one texting me, nor did she request following me on Instagram. I tracked the number. And it turns out to be from one of those fake phone number apps. I requested to be blocked from the service. And I never heard from my friend again. After talking about it with my brother and a few friends, I'm almost certain it was the girl that had been following me. These things only started after she appeared the phone calls to my office, the fake Facebook friend requests. And a few days before I was pulled aside by my boss, my friend texted me and told me she had a weird feeling about me and wanted to make sure I was okay. I just thought she was being weird at the time and tried not to think too much of it. This whole ordeal is really scary when I looked back on it because I sent videos of myself and my address at one point. My friend even confirmed a post my brother made with pictures he tagged me on on Facebook. I was texting a stranger for eight months about my life. And they also apparently have access to my Facebook page. I still see this girl since she obviously works in the same area as me. She doesn't follow me around as much. But when she does see me on the metro, she always watches me or sits somewhere, she'll be able to make eye contact with me. I'm always careful now if anyone texts me from an unrecognizable phone number. And I'm just paranoid. I know this story might seem a bit all over the place, especially with the conclusion I came to of the girl posing as my friend. But I had to get this off my chest. So creepy girl who's been following me staring at me and most likely catfished me. I don't ever want to meet you again. 
I really don't know why I didn't suspect my friend wasn't really her at the start. She obviously had my phone number, and she knew my mom and brother's name where I went to college, and the fact that we went to high school together. So you can see why it was very convincing. Back in college, I took a road trip from Philadelphia to Washington. I was driving through the Midwest, but I can't remember where exactly. I drove through the US multiple times and I can't remember if this happened on the upper or lower routes I'd taken. If I had to guess, I'd bet that it was Wyoming. It was late at night on an empty road. I was cruising at a decent speed, my car was working fine, and I had adequate snacks and water. And I was just jamming out to some CDs. Life was good when I suddenly got an overwhelming feeling of something weird happening around me. I couldn't see anything besides the road. There were no mountains visible, the sky was overcast, and the only thing in existence seemed to be me and what was illuminated by my headlights. It was then that I saw another car, the only car I'd seen for a few hours, which stood out due to that it was a pickup truck with lots of rust around the back, and it had one of those cabin things on the bed the covers with the windows, I don't know what they're called, that looked half busted with duct tape all over the window part. I hadn't seen it prior, and would have known it was driving in front of me too. And there were no connecting roads. So it must have come in from either the grass or off the shoulder where it had been parked. Anyway, I'm still cruising, but it was weird. I remember being frustrated because the guy in front of me was slowly reducing his speed and thus mine. I considered passing him, but it was only two lanes and I didn't really want to do it in the dark, so whatever. It hit ahead when I noticed that in front of us, there was a tiny forest all around the road. It stretched on for maybe 300 yards and half of that away from the road, but covered it on both sides. The guy in front of me kept slowing down, but when we approached this point, he really started slowing down, almost like he intended to stop. This was not good. I suddenly passed him and sped up like a bat out of hell, putting everything in my trusty Crown Vic into action. I saw out the mirror that the truck ended up stopping and pulling off to the side completely, as I'm flooring it and thinking I must be paranoid, and the guy might need help. I see a van slash truck, one of those big box types parked in the trees off the road, and some shadows of people walking in front of it. I wasn't going to stop anyway, but that kept me from even thinking about the idea. Woke me right the hell up. Occasionally I do wonder what the hell they were up to. When I was pretty young, my mum would take me into the country and to an old couple's house where I would be babysat. The couple's names were Carol and Roy, really amazing and sweet people who had an old swing up back and games for me to play. I don't remember much as I was around three to four years old at the time, but I recall how the house smelled, that old people smell, and playing hungry, hungry hippos on the living room floor. Obviously, as I got older, and naturally didn't need a babysitter quite as often, we fell out of touch, only reaching out every few years or so. Fast forward to high school, and I'd been sent to live with my dad because I was rebelling pretty hard against my mum at the time. I grew up very poor, and was starting to realise I didn't want to be in this situation anymore, that I wanted more out of life. This caused a ton of problems at home, but my relocation changed my life for the better. After I straightened my act up, I went on a sort of apology tour to all the people who used to know me when I lived with my mum. I felt like I needed people to know that I wasn't a bad person and that I had actually changed for the better. I hadn't thought about my old babysitters because they only knew me when I was very little. And as it goes, one morning, I was getting ready for school and throwing on a pair of pants when in my head I heard my own voice say, Carol and Roy have passed away. I stopped what I was doing because it didn't seem like I had thought it at all, like the words were just put there out the blue. I was really freaked out, so after school I called my mum immediately. 
I asked if they still had their number, and she asked why. I just told her that I knew something was wrong, and that I should call and check on them. I had such a dreadful feeling. But then my mum called me back and said, Carol and Roy are fine. I told them you wanted to see them again, and they said for you to come over next week. I was dumbfounded, because I couldn't explain that awful premonition I had, and the terrible feeling that came with it. I just thought, oh well, I guess I'm nuts, I'll go see them next week. A few days pass, and it's the day before I'm supposed to go over to their house and hang out with them. When I get another call from mum, she said she had just called to confirm plans, but Roy answered saying that Carol had collapsed in the bathroom the previous night, and passed away from a massive heart attack. I was absolutely floored. I told you I knew something was wrong and you didn't believe me. That's what I said. I don't know if Roy is still with us. Mum called back once and he was crying, and he was saying how hard it is to sleep alone without her next to him. For many, many years, she would end the night with, I love you. And now, she was gone. This happened over 15 years ago, and it is still clear as day to me. It took me around six years to share this with anyone, as I was in fear that it would return. I was staying with my parents at a hotel in South Florida with a friend of mine. We had a Pop Warner football jamboree the following day. I wouldn't really call it a hotel, more like a day's in. I'll try to be as descriptive as possible. You ever get the feeling that something is watching you? Or trying to get your attention without making a sound? This feeling was so intense, and hit my gut so hard. The feeling mostly made me nervous, and this is what woke me out of a deep sleep at 3 or 4am. I sit up in bed, and immediately get that awkward feeling. I look around the room and see my parents sleeping to the bed closest to the entrance of the room. My friend and I are on the bed closest to the window. The only thing bringing a little bit of light into the room is the alarm clock and the crack under the door to the main hall. While I'm looking around the room, I'm drawn to the window next to the bed. It looks open because the curtains are moving, but it's a window that can't be opened. About 15 seconds go by, and I can't stop looking at the window. I become so nervous and worried for some reason. Similar feeling to when you know something bad's gonna happen. Kind of like going on a scary ride for the first time, but 10 times scarier than that. Then out of nowhere, this object appears at the window. Keep in mind, we're on the fourth floor at this point, and it's hard to describe this figure, but the best way I could describe it would be comparing it to something. At the moment, I knew nothing about the Grim Reaper, but if I had to compare it to anything, it would be that. It was a cloud, very realistic in shape, taller than a grown man. It didn't have a scythe, it was just itself. The feeling I got is something I'll never forget, and like I said, words can't describe it. As it came slowly into the room, it made its way to the front of my bed, then stopped. Now facing the door entrance to our room, I could sense it knew I was watching or seeing it. About six seconds went by, when it slowly turns its covered head towards me. As it was turning towards me, I got out of bed and pulled the blankets off and hid under the bed and waited, being so young and unaware of the worst case scenario as being dragged from under the bed and taken away from my parents was probably that. I waited, but nothing happened. I just waited until the sun came up, and my parents asked me what I was doing on the floor. My friends always ask me, why didn't I scream or yell for my parents? I tell them that this thing brought so much fear into me, I couldn't even begin to comprehend what was happening. I was terrified, and didn't say a word of it for six years only when another friend of mine shared a pretty intense story. But nothing has happened since. No ghost or anything like that. I just wanted you to know. And if anyone has a similar experience, I'd love to hear about it. 
For all of those of you wondering if this is sleep paralysis, I've had it before, and it wasn't that. Not to mention, I couldn't have been found under the bed if I'd have had sleep paralysis. In any case, I'm not exactly the religious type, but I just wish to know what the hell I saw that fateful night long ago. When I was a little kid, around first or second grader, usually my mother picked us up at school and brought me to her office. In the afternoon, she played tennis. Coincidentally, on the opposite side of the tennis courts, there was a big cemetery. At this day, among any other day, there were burials in progress, and the weather was a little bit cloudy, so you could see orangey sunbeams piercing through the clouds. When I look at the sunbeams, I saw a shadow, a figure of a man floating in the middle of it. The shadow figure was lifted to the clouds via the sunbeam, and not only one, but there were two. Then I shrugged it off, picked the tennis balls up, and prepared to go home with my mother. On our way back, we had to pass through the way where the cemetery was located, and I asked, How many people died today, Mum? I don't know for sure, maybe two? There are two hearses parked over there, my mum said, while pointing at them. When people die, do they go to the sky? I asked curiously. Yes, my dear. They go to the heavens, my mum replied. And ever since then, I always try to look up at the sunbeams whenever there's a burial in cemetery areas. But to no avail, I can't see any of the shadowy figures anymore. I'm very close with my grandparents. My grandma is still alive, but my grandpa passed in November 2019. He was in pretty good shape for an 85 year old guy. My grandma, on the other hand, well, she's had strokes and heart problems. We all thought, even though she was four years younger than him, that he would be the first to go. Go back to around three to four months before he passed. I wake up visibly upset and my husband wakes up thinking it's my sugar getting low, as I'm a type 1 diabetic. It was not. I had a pretty realistic dream. Not scary in the sense of a night terror or nightmare. In my dream, my mum called and told me my grandpa had passed in his sleep. That's when I woke up. Fast forward to the morning, he passed. My mum called and it would have played out just like my dream if I'd have not had my phone on silent. Other strange things that have happened is when I was around my great grandmother around the time of her passing, and I was my husband's grandmother end of life caretaker for three years, both reached up and would hug the air. And we family and I would feel rushes of air like someone passed, heard footsteps and could hear whispers of passing grandmas like they're having a conversation even though there's no one there, and they're not talking to anyone. Back to present day, my grandma is getting bad, super depressed, nods out for a split second, and is then childish, even more so after her stroke and super depressed. She just wants to go. I feel like the love of a person's life comes to get them when they're at their end. I almost feel like my grandpa is procrastinating. My mum just had a dream where my grandpa walked in and said, let's go baby, and took my grandma and they left. My mum believes loved ones come for you when you are on the end. And she has heard my grandpa when my grandma passed. Do you think she might have had a premonition dream? I'm not sure. Grandma says she heard her dad's footsteps and cough when my grandma passed but does not flat out say she believes in that kind of thing. Who knows? When I was 15, Ray William Johnson was the most subscribed YouTube channel out there. I feel it necessary to say now that he was not the YouTuber that this story is about, but I feel it's important to include it for context. Doing some research before sharing this, he was the first YouTube channel to reach 5 million subscribers. So he was very popular at the time. In his show, he reviewed viral videos 
and as a teenager, it was one of my favorite things to watch. Every week, he picked one subscriber video to provide the comment question of the week, to which his subscribers would provide responses in the comment section. A friend and I thought we had a great question featuring her new baby iguana to ask and sent it in every week after filming it. By the fourth or fifth week, our video was selected and aired on that week's show. In hindsight, there definitely wasn't that much traffic coming into my account, but at the time it really felt like it. I had 30 some messages in my message box at the time, and quite a few comments on the original video. I can confidently say, let's not meet to anyone in that comment section, garnering such classy comments such as, I tap the both of you at the same time. I would do both, and the iguana can watch. My friend at the time was 13 years old, and my message box did not look much different. Now as a teenager with low self esteem, I was pleased with a lot of this new attention. I was actually taking the time to respond to a lot of my messages, ignoring the disgusting ones and thanking people for congratulating me on getting picked and occasionally starting up a conversation with some internet strangers. One of the most common questions I got asked after this video was how old are you? And of course, I offered up that information readily. One specific person sticks out because he continued talking to me constantly. Every day, I would have a new message from him and I would respond. He was just chatting, just being nice, I thought. He had a YouTube account, small, but had a couple of thousand subscribers. Having had 11 myself, all of which being my friends, I thought it was so cool that his channel was successful. He asked me how old I was. I told him I was 15, and he told me he was 21. It was initially quite tame conversation, but after a few weeks, he asked me for my phone number. I was naive. I gave it to him because he was nice, and he didn't live anywhere near me. From what he told me, we lived several states away. Then the texting started, and he tried calling me. Around here is where I started getting creeped out. He began talking about wanting to meet me. Now at this point, I'd seen to catch a predator in school, and I started getting somewhat suspicious. I never gave him more information than the state I lived in, and my first name. That seemed innocent enough. But he started getting flirty and creepy and generally uncomfortable to talk to. I slowly stopped responding, ignored the phone calls and said I was busy. Then he found my social media accounts and started talking to me there. I told him that I had gotten a boyfriend, which was a lie, but he still sent me some generally discomforting messages, especially looking back. This guy made me so uncomfortable that even thinking about it now or seeing his username makes me feel nauseated and tense. The message that really got me was one that finally scared me enough, and the one I actually can remember after all those years. It said, I'm coming to Ohio, and I'm gonna find you. And when I do, I'm gonna hug you so hard, I'm gonna squeeze until your eyes pop out your little head. Smiley face. I never told my parents, but I was lucky enough to be able to get my phone number changed. I started getting paranoid that he would find me, checking the locks, closing the curtains. I removed him from some social media, changed my username and display names to make myself harder to find, because, you know, I was a teenager and my priorities were to be in contact with my actual friends at all times. Surprisingly, it got quiet for a while and slowly I gained some feelings of safety back. I actually even started a new YouTube channel at the recommendation of some friends and started putting myself out there again, doing more media productions, which I love and garnering a small following of about 1200 strangers. 
a few years down the road, I was starting freshman year of college. I had just turned 18, and wouldn't you know he found me again. He followed me on all my social media, sent me messages again and posted some comments on my old YouTube channel all at once. I felt sick. I remembered all the creepy messages and unsettling feelings and just general breathlessness I had when he started telling me he would find me and that he was coming for me. I had a brief panic attack before swiftly blocking him on everything. My profile pictures were me at my new college wearing the gear and everything. I would have been significantly easier to find now, and I knew that. I hardly made any friends that first year of college. I didn't leave my room much after that happened, and I never went to parties. I scarcely made any friends, and every so often I remember the experience and get sick. This is one of those times I've since graduated. I've moved far away with my boyfriend. I still check my locks and curtains aggressively every night, sometimes three to four times a night, even if I'm sure I've done it. What I'll never understand is how a grown man at 21 would be interested in a 15 year old girl, and especially still be interested after several years. The entire memory repulses me. He still posts to that YouTube channel and all I can think about is how he tried to get me when I was a minor. He was a predator. He took away my sense of safety. And up to this point, he's certainly on my top 10 people with whom I wish to never have an encounter with again. When I was in seventh grade, my parents decided to take a three week long summer trip to Europe. Most of the vacation was amazing. After all, I was a child in a different continent, and some people never get that chance to travel ever. But while I was in France, some things went down that I have thought about for years, and that still give me chills. We were staying at a pretty nice hotel. I don't remember much except sharing a room with my little sister and my parents sharing the other. But one night my parents went out to eat and said that I should take my sister to the hotel's indoor kids area for an hour and then go back to the room. So I did that. While at the play area, I watched my sister. Other people were there, mostly adults, all of whom I assumed were watching their children. But at one point, one of the aforementioned adults started talking to me, a brown haired man who simply looked like your average Joe and didn't seem menacing at all. I just thought he was trying to make conversation with the weird girl sitting alone in the kids play area. So I conversed with him, basic stuff at first, how I liked traveling and where I came from. Then it got a little more personal, how old I was, where were my parents, and was another sibling with me? When he asked these questions, he would take his phone out and slightly point at me. But being a dumb middle schooler, I didn't stop talking or leave. We had been talking for nearly 20 minutes and I noticed it had been around an hour. So I said bye to him and went to grab my sister. I get her out and leave the area. But out of the corner of my eye, I see him pull out his phone and point dead straight at me. Even at 12, I could realize something was out of whack. So I booked it as fast as I could back to the hotel room. When my parents returned, I didn't tell them of the incident because I didn't want to hear a lecture on stranger danger. Besides, I thought I had seen the last of Mr. Creeper, but I was not that lucky. A different time when I took my sister to the play area, I saw the same man. I wasn't too worried as there were other adults around, so it's not like he could take me there and then, but I still wanted to avoid conversation though. He started talking to me, addressing me by name, which somehow made the whole situation even more uncomfortable. I spoke with him though until he asked what my room number was. I said that my parents said I should never tell another person my room number, which was true but I mainly just didn't want this weirdo to get the number. He said, that's a rule that only applied to strangers and that me and him were not. 
While he said this, he was touching my shoulder, which made me want to scream. Funny he said that we weren't strangers, because I then realized that I was the one giving all the personal information. I don't even think he told me where he came from. He said his name was Paul, but that name is so generic he could have been lying, which he probably was. Those thoughts triggered me to say that I had to go. I was late to see my parents. I snatched my little sister and ran to the hotel's front desk, scared that if I went to my room, the man would follow. I told the people at the desk the description of the man and where he was. They told me to go to my room and that they would take care of it. I went back to my room where my parents were waiting and told them. We left on a train early the next day and I wasn't alone again for the rest of that trip. My mother-in-law was kind of sick, with diverticulosis. At that moment, nothing to worry about. So this day we went to visit her and she was fine, eating, no more fever, and I hugged her and as soon as we disconnected, I felt this strange energy. The first thing that came to my mind was, there's no way that she's gonna survive. We dined, spoke after a while, and then me, my wife and our kids went home. They were upstairs and I was washing the dishes. I looked out our living room and I saw this man, tall, fully dressed in white, smiling at me. For a moment I was paralyzed. I looked at the dishes I was washing and then he was gone. It wasn't scary, it was relieving. I washed the dishes and went upstairs and didn't tell my wife what happened as she practices spiritualism and she would freak out or so I thought. The next morning, my mother-in-law went to the ICU and I never saw her again, as she died of multiple organ failure the morning after. I ended up telling my wife about this as she passed away from multiple organ failure some hours after. I ended up telling my wife about this a few hours before her mum passed. And she said the night I felt that thing and saw the tall and slender white dressed guy her uncle actually incorporated some spirit that said that was her last night and she felt the exact same thing I did. I don't know how I feel about these kind of things. I'm somewhere in between an atheist and someone who believes in a bunch of unexplained things as I've had my fair share of creepy experiences. A couple of years ago on Christmas day, my mum, paternal grandmother and I paid a visit to my dad's grave. It had been roughly a year and all three of us were missing him horribly. We parked the car, walked to his grave and stood there in silence. As I stood there with my head bowed, I silently said to myself, Dad, I miss you. Show me that you're still here and watching over me. Not immediately after, but perhaps 30 seconds after having said that, a strong gust of wind blew, strange for an otherwise calm sunny day. A small cyclone of leaves formed around a few feet behind where we were standing and made a straight path to the car that was parked about 40 yards away. As soon as it reached the car, it was gone. We didn't think much of it. But we said our goodbyes and walked back to the car. What we found will always stay with me. By my door, a penny dated 1998. By my mum's door, a penny from 1980. And my grandmother's 1958. The significance behind these dates? 1998 was the year he passed. And I was the last one to hug him that night before he went to work. 1980 was the year him and my mother got married. And 1958, that was the year he was born. During a road trip from New Jersey to North Carolina, my friend and I decided we were hungry and went looking for food in a town in Maryland. I don't really remember the name of the town, but it felt very strange as soon as we pulled onto the main road, as there didn't seem to be any people out and about. It was the middle of the day, but no one was walking around. There weren't any restaurant food options other than the pizza place. So we pulled up and parked in front of it. 
It seemed like everyone in the town must have gone to the pizza place. And when we parked the car, everyone in the restaurant turns and looks at our car through the big glass windows. Like at the same time, they stared at us, we stared at them. It felt so weird that I said, I don't want to go in there. My friend just nodded at me wide eyed and we drove to another town for lunch. Why was seemingly the whole town in that pizza place? What was with the staring? I'm almost a little sorry we didn't go in and find out. But at the same time, not sorry at all. I woke up at night for a glass of water. I walked into the kitchen and ran into my dad. He walked right past me to the front door, didn't even acknowledge me being there. Where are you going? I asked him. He didn't say anything and just had a blank stare and walked out the door. I walked over and looked out the window, looked through the peephole, and we had a small walkway that connects to our driveway. He was sitting on the hallway hunched over, elbows on his knees under a big tree. That was in front of my bedroom, just staring into nothing. I walked into my mum's bedroom and asked her why dad was outside. She turned over and said, What do you mean? He's right here. There was my dad, laying by my mum's side, in a deep sleep. I used to really enjoy driving around at night, especially because round where I live, there are lots of country roads and they were fun to zip around. One evening after I'd been at a friend's house, I decided to drive to my church, about a half hour away from home, and back just listening to music. The route is one I've done most Sundays for 17 years being driven, and I have been driving it for about four years at this point. So even in the dark, I felt fine to drive the speed limit, which is 60. I got maybe a quarter of a mile there, and my stomach started twisting. I knew that if I kept on going, I regret it. But I shook it off. It wasn't late and the weather was fine. I wasn't going to miss this driving opportunity. But as I got further, the feeling in my stomach got worse. And I realized I had to turn around. Just before I reached the hill pass that's about halfway to the church, I pulled a U turn and went home and stopped feeling so anxious and forgot about it. The next day, I woke up and got in my car to go to church to find my usual route had been closed. Turned out that on the hill pass, the road had crumbled away, leaving a sheer drop that would have been around a blind bend for me. The road issue had been called in by a driver going the opposite direction to me about five minutes after I had pulled a Yui and driven away. I would definitely have been at the very least badly hurt had I kept on going. My family moved into a new home about four years ago. And I've always had an off feeling about the house, but I put it down to paranoia. I woke up in the middle of the night with scratches all over my body. But I had no reason to think I wasn't doing it in my sleep. I moved on to being a college student living on campus. I haven't woken up with scratches once. Now home for the holidays. The first night staying back in the house, I woke up with scratches. I stayed again and woke up with scratches the next morning. And my girlfriend finally made me realize it was only happening when I was staying home. So I stayed at her house for around four days and didn't get scratched once. Now writing this, I had just stayed in my house again last night, and woke up with a scratch on my side. And now I feel more creeped out than ever. I don't own any pets and due to living on campus, my old room was taken over by my younger brother. So this happened sleeping in two different rooms. I've read about others experiences. And next time I will sleep with gloves. I honestly don't want to wake up with new scratches. The thought of it is terrifying. It was about 1.45pm in Houston, Texas. I was driving to my job as a nanny about 15 minutes away from my house. 
Currently, I was less than a minute away from my house, in my car, waiting at a red light. The light turned green, and I accelerated as you do. While I was reaching the end of the intersection, and a car from the cross lane of traffic ran his red light and darted in front of me, so quickly, I didn't have any time to brake at all. I hit him going at roughly 15 to 20, and immediately he got out his car and gestured for me to unlock my passenger side door, which I did because I was frazzled, having just gotten into a car accident. He immediately opened his door and started spinning a tail. Listen, I'm an off duty police officer chasing a suspect, didn't you see me? No, I said, because he hadn't been chasing anyone. Traffic was slow since we were in a residential area and no other cars had decided to run a red light. Didn't you see my lights? No, because he didn't have any lights. He was in an older model SUV or minivan, not a police car. Keep in mind, he also wasn't in any sort of uniform, just a blue shirt and jeans. He was very thin, between the ages of 40 to 50 and had no police gear with him. Well, I can call 911 and have you arrested, he said. I had right of way, I told him, since my light was green, and I'm gonna need to see some ID. I'm proud to say that I, despite being a short girl, was decidedly unfriendly. I am absolutely not trying to get scammed on my way to work, but he gave me a look like, wow, I can't believe this idiot is asking me for ID. Listen, I'm undercover. I'm with the feds. So in the span of 30 seconds, he's risen from a member of the Houston PD to an undercover federal agent. Right. I'm gonna need to see some ID. I'm undercover. My life and operation will be at risk if you don't comply. Your life is in danger. There are people watching me right now. I stared back at him unimpressed. My mother has told me multiple times, ever since I was a baby, I've been able to communicate with a single expression how little I care for the lives of others. I was giving him that look, the one that says, why does a simple ant think he has the right to speak to me? I'm going to need some ID and insurance. I insisted. Now, having apparently given up, he noticed that my purse was on the passenger seat. Keep in mind he's leaning through the passenger door, which I had foolishly unlocked for him. Having thought this was going to be a normal car accident, he reached for it now, grabbing the canvas of the bag as opposed to the leather handle. I'm gonna need this, he began. But I interrupted, grabbing my purse in a death grip. I may be small, but my grip is about the same strength as a pit bull and there's no way I was gonna let him hit my car and then have the audacity to steal my purse. No, you don't. Yes, I need to see ID so that I can report you. I don't even remember what bogus lies he told me. He was rambling at this point. He told me something about pretending to be a pimp. He needed me to pretend to give him money. His family was at risk. I don't know. At one point, he almost looked close to tears, which frankly was a bit much. There is absolutely no reason you need my purse and when you will not be getting it. You can't have it. If you're a federal agent, give me ID. I was gripping my purse so firmly my fingers were turning white from pressure. I kept glancing at where my cell phone was in the cup holder, but I didn't think I'd be quick enough to grab it and dial for the real police before he took it. He didn't ever try to jerk it from my grip, which is probably good because I would have straight up lost it to him. My car was still on and still drivable, and I'm not even joking when I say that I would have run his dumb ass down. He finally let go. Fine, let's meet at the nearest gas station. The one across the street? I asked. No, the one down the road. Can I trust you to meet me there? Yes, of course, I lied unconvincingly. I'm a good liar, don't get me wrong, but I wasn't even trying to act like I was going to meet him. I just wanted him to get out of my car. I was already thinking of the damages and how much it would cost, and if he wanted to take what little money I had, he would have to pry it from my cold, mortis rigged fingers one by one, because I would never let him have it. Okay, I'll meet you at the gas station down the road. Can I trust you not to go to the police? He said. Yeah, fine. He finally left, entered his vehicle and started it up. 
He tried to have me go first, but I was having none of it. And I gestured him and he gestured me. And I was still wearing that absolute deadpan face. I was already on the phone with the police when he turned down the street that led to the gas station. And I obviously passed him and drove straight to the nearest police station as the operator advised me. I actually wasn't scared during this process. I'm someone who tends to get unnaturally calm during a crisis, but I was completely calm while making the statement with the police, not 20 minutes later. But of course, as soon as I walk out the police station, I just broke down sobbing. I wouldn't say this is the scariest thing that's ever happened to me, but it was scary because I'd recently moved to Houston and all my family and extended family lives in Washington state. So I felt alone. I live with my aunt and cousin, but I have three siblings and 15 cousins and 17 aunts and uncles and a whole host of extended family in Washington. And I never realized how safe I felt in my small town until I was almost robbed in the big city. Also, since I'm paranoid and listen to a lot of true crime media, I parked my car a few streets over from my house and walked home. He had mentioned something about me living in the neighborhood that was within walking distance of the car accident, as well as trying to convince me I knew him somehow, which was strange. And also stupid, as I legitimately don't know anyone in Houston. In any case, I'm grateful that nothing more happened with this incident. Thank you for listening. And beware of dumb drivers that hit you with your car and then try to take things from you. Remember, you can always ask a cop for ID and do not let anyone take anything from you without there being good reason for it. Me and my boyfriend used to love going to the graveyard at night to hang out and drink. We know this probably isn't the best or most respectful reason to go, but as teenagers, we didn't have a lot of options regarding places we could do these things under our parents' roofs. We lived out in the middle of nowhere, and there was hardly anywhere decent other than our car, which got boring pretty quickly. So we're at this graveyard that we frequent a lot. It hardly ever has anyone there and there's no security. So we're just chilling towards the back. It's sort of in an L shape and there's a decent fence and some hedges that blocks us nearly completely from view. We're just there having a laugh. He lights up a cigarette and we're talking about some mundane stuff that he saw on the TV. When out of nowhere, his face contorts at a confused stare and says, look behind you. I look and see nothing. I look back about to give him a confused look when he just gets up drops the cigarette, doesn't stamp on it, and runs. I start shouting at him, asking what the hell he's doing, and naturally, quickly gather my stuff up and walk his way. I don't understand why he's running, and I look around me and see nothing. So I'm leaving, but with no urgency. When I reach the car, he's panting like he's run a half marathon. And I ask him what the hell he was up to, and why he fled. He looks at me dead in the eyes. And after a few seconds of composing himself says, there was someone behind you. I look at him. No, there wasn't. I was right there. There was no one behind me. He pauses for a second and goes, she was right behind you. I don't know how to describe it. But she was pearly white and floated right behind you. That was all he could say, that she floated behind me. We cut the night short, he dropped me home, and we spoke of it no more. I still wish I knew what it was he saw. I wish I'd have turned around at that moment. But the fact that I didn't see it makes me doubt it. We weren't smoking anything illegal, if that's what you're thinking. It was just a little bit of booze and not even that much, just a little bit buzzed. So I guess I'll never know, but it does make me curious and I would like to see a phantom one day to experience something like this for myself. This happened in an old farmhouse a few miles away from where I live and the case is unsolved today. I live in Bavaria, Germany. 
It's an area with a lot of mountains and forests. This incident happened over a 100 years ago. The family who lived in the farmhouse along with its two workers experienced many strange paranormal things like foot trails and the snow which just led to nowhere, a few meters to the edge of the forest perhaps, and strange sounds at night. And the youngest daughter was telling the family that she was often visited by a tall man at night. One morning, the whole family was found dead in their beds. Everyone had their heads smashed in with a blunt object. There were no signs that someone broke in, and the doors were all locked when the police arrived. Nothing was taken from the family, not even the gold necklace that the mother owned, which was right beside her bed, and should be obvious if it were a burglary. The police also stated that there had been a lot of hate involved in the crime due to the brutality. The police investigated the crime scene, but didn't find anything. Another weird thing that happened in the barn. They locked it to investigate it later because there wasn't anything remarkable at first. But when they later returned, there was a rope with that hanging knot hanging from the ceiling. No one knew how it got there. Well, the case is around 100 years old. And if it happened nowadays, the police probably would be able to solve it with modern technology. But the paranormal things surrounding the house really creeped everyone out. I've never visited the farmhouse, but many stay it's still haunted. I'm not sure about that personally. When I was a sophomore in high school, a friend would drive me home. One day we went to a record store with two other friends and on the way back to drop me off, this guy in a truck passed us, narrowly missing our car and oncoming traffic, and we decided it'd be fun to follow him for a bit. So he turns onto another road shortly after and immediately pulls up to a mailbox and starts retrieving his mail. As we pass him, all four of us flip him off out the window and continue driving down the road. About half a mile later, we see the same vehicle driving insanely fast behind us. He tailgates us for a bit, and we start to panic a little. We start to slow down for a stop sign, and the guy whips around and cuts us off, slamming on his brakes in front of us. We wait for the moment, and he steps out of his car with a crowbar. We drive around him, but there's a stop sign in front of us we had to briefly pause at. The guy runs towards my door and grabs it when my friend takes off. We're flying down the road hoping to lose him. We make another turn onto a really busy street and think we've lost him, and we turn again and drive normally for a few miles. At this point, we're convinced we're safe. We pull up to another intersection and are waiting in the right turn lane. We look behind us, and two or three cars away is the same dude, in the turning lane flashing his headlights on and off. We make our turn and speed down the road, but so does the other guy. He speeds around us and slams on his brakes, forcing us to stop. We try and go around him, but he keeps maneuvering so we can't do that. Eventually, we stop and I say something stupid like, Maybe he just wants to talk to us. So he's straddling both lanes of the road, gets out of his car with his crowbar in hand and a terrifying look on his face. My friend drives off the road, gets around the dude and we speed away. Of course, he does the same and is driving like a maniac, but so are we, and we maintain a bit of lead on him. We make another turn and there's a school bus in front of us, just about to stop. We speed around it just in time for the bus's stop sign to extend, and for some reason the dude actually stops behind it and we speed off. We were close to another friend's house, so we pull into their driveway and into the open garage. We're all terrified at this point, so we run inside and watch out the window for this guy. He drives past the house, but thank goodness we were parked in the garage so he didn't see the car. Moral of the story? Don't mess with people. They may be crazy. Me and my friends love to go exploring out in the middle of nowhere. One friend had a tip off that there was a really cool and undisturbed place, an abandoned graveyard complete with several mausoleums that could be ventured into. He said that one of them had the door unlocked, courtesy of one of his other friends, and that it was a cool place to look around. 
really big, and obviously the people who perished here had lots of money, which is uncommon in this part of where we live. So one evening we made our trip out, it had to be night you see. We brought with us several decent flashlights and a couple of beers just to keep the buzz coming along. We were walking around, chatting and chilling, and we got to this creepy gate. It was unlocked and we made our way in. We made sure to be respectful in the graveyard, but really wanted to see the mausoleum. When we were getting there, one of my friends, John, was walking around behind the mausoleum. We paid him no mind, he's old enough to look after himself, and we were sure he'd be okay. I was looking inside. The detailing inside this crypt was incredible. This person must have been really loved, I thought. This was the kind of stuff I was thinking, when, rather quickly and unexpectedly, do we hear a cry. We run out from the mausoleum, and it seems that John has fallen into a grave. I didn't even know that could happen. Turns out this graveyard was really old. What happened exactly is that he was walking and he felt someone pull him, and at that moment, he fell straight onto the ground. But the ground immediately gave way, and he fell. We were worried he might get tetanus or something, but there was nothing wrong with him, he didn't cut himself on any of the wood. We're pretty sure that the old coffin had pretty much been destroyed by termites, and he had fallen almost through it. It was a creepy experience, no doubt. In truth, if he hadn't fallen on his hands, he probably would have gone further down, but it was unsettling nonetheless. He never came back with us when we returned to explore again. This didn't happen to me, but my friend. Back in 1998, I was at second grade and was coming home from school alone for the first time. I had a bit of overprotective parents since I lived about a block away from my school, and I was stopped by an elderly woman who said she had something to tell me. She said she had no husband, had lost her son years ago, and just wanted to give me a hug. Something about this woman gave me the creeps, and now later on thinking she did look and talk a bit weird almost like she was a man dressed in old woman's clothes. But this could really just have been my juvenile imagination messing around. After asking me for a hug, she reached her hands towards me and motioned for wanting a hug. I took off and ran as fast as I could all the way home. As I ran, I heard her laughing really loud in a low, manly laugh. When I got home, I told my mum about it but she wasn't worried at all and told me that it was probably just an old and lonely woman who needed a hug. Here in Finland, we have this magazine called Alibi, which has the most recent news about burglaries, thefts, and all manner of terrible, terrible things. And for some reason, eight-year-old me was not allowed to go anywhere near this magazine, obviously. But a few weeks after the incident with the old woman, I did get my hands on a copy which was brand new. I read about an incident that happened in the area in which I lived, about a boy my age last seen by his friends hugging an old woman and walking somewhere with her never to be seen again. The case is still unsolved today, 15 years later, and it gives me the shivers, as that could have been me. But I feel for that poor, poor boy. I'm a woman in my early 20s, who had, at the time, long, bright pink hair all the way down my back. Because of this, I'm very easy to spot in crowds and from afar. My best friend and I were traveling the French and Italian Riviera. Before going, my overly protective parents had been ranting about Taken, the movie, which only seemed laughable to me. We had been traveling for six days at that point, exploring Monaco, Menton, and Ventimiglia by foot. We had mostly had an amazing journey. The creepiest things we had encountered were so far catcallers, a men that both looked and acted like they had never seen a woman before. 
but it was all fine. The thing that happened on our last night, however, really shook us to the core. Given how we had just let our guard down, since the city of Menton had turned out to feel so safe. It felt like this event came completely out of nowhere. The false confidence that made us feel like we could deal with anything could have really put us in danger that night. So to begin, the evening went like it had since we arrived. After adventuring all morning, and then slacking at the beach all afternoon, we had made ourselves pretty impresentable again to have a little dinner by the beach promenade. After some cocktails and wine, we were both pretty buzzed, and we had agreed that the first thing we would order at the wine bar we were planning on going to next would be a big bottle of water to share. We had been going to this wine bar for three nights in a row. It was situated in one of the busier and more touristy streets where most shops were kept open till midnight. We walked there from the promenade giggling and having a great time as usual. After being greeted by the server, who was happy to see us again, we got ourselves seats at a table outside of the bar facing the busy street, where we could enjoy the late evening breeze as well as people watch. We were pretty used to men staring at us at that point, both young and old. I had developed pretty good tunnel vision while outside, and I tended to not look directly at men unless they were standing directly in my way, or if I accidentally space out or something. After we had ordered our wine, cheese, and water bottle, my friend went to the bathroom inside. I sat facing the street, and I was checking my phone, and when I randomly looked up, I met the eyes of a bald man in the midst of passing by. He was very tall, wore dark glasses, and blue and white striped nice looking shirt. He also wore some expensive looking dark leather shoes, and had a clock that also looked quite pricey around his wrist. In other words, he looked pretty anonymous at the Riviera, nicely dressed, but also kind of strange as he wore white socks in that temperature. We got eye contact as he was walking by, and then stopped for a second while holding the gaze and then started walking again, only to look right back at me. Naturally, I looked away, and then he seemingly left, and I did not think any more of it. After my friend had returned from the bathroom, and we had started tasted the different sorts of cheese and Italian prosciuttos, I looked up to see him standing there again, leaning on a wall across the street. Fifteen minutes must have passed, but once again I caught him looking at us with his phone aimed in our direction, held upright, as if he was taking pictures. I started getting the creeps, so I just casually asked my friend, who sat with her back towards him, if she had noticed him before also. She declined, and I tried to explain that he seemed to be lurking at us, but that at least he must have been aware that we'd seen him. Thinking that would be enough to make him lose interest, I told her to act like nothing and just forget about it, while we would continue to enjoy our last night at the Riviera. Every now and then, however, I would catch him staring at us, only to then nonchalantly start texting on his phone, or look away. Something just really irked me about how he was trying so hard to pretend he was doing everything else. I finally let my friend know that he was still there, and she started freaking out more visibly than me, turning around all the time very obviously for him to see. The man started pacing around, picking up the phone to his ear without speaking. I could tell there was no light on the screen, and I was starting to become not only uncomfortable but kind of angry too, so I stared directly back at him, just to make goddamn sure that I knew he was watching us. At this point, I picked up my phone irritated, pretended to take pictures of the cheese platter, but actually of him just for proof in case he was trying anything strange. More than an hour had passed at this point, and the tiny doubt that I had that he maybe was just waiting for someone started to diminish. In just an hour, most of the shops and restaurants would be closing, including the wine bar we sat in. He definitely wasn't waiting for anyone 
and I knew that eventually we would have to leave for the hotel. But what if he were to follow us? What if that's what he was waiting for? Eventually, he walked up the street and had seemed to disappear. I felt relieved, but did not put my guard down yet. And just 10 minutes later, he came walking back down the street again, pretending like nothing happened. Now we were both starting to get more scared. And we saw how the street became less and less crowded, and how shops were starting to close down. The man looked at us from further down the street. And when he seemed to have become aware that we noticed him again, he vanished into a shop, waited for a few minutes, and then came out again without having bought anything, looking at us like before. We were really questioning what to do at this point, as well as what he wanted. As mentioned, we were both pretty buzzed from before. And after a few more wine glasses, my brain could not work as fast as usual. The man then walked further down the street and stood beside an ice cream bar. He was there for 15 minutes without buying anything nor leaving, just occasionally turning around to look at us. We were starting to struggle to keep an eye on him, because as I mentioned, he looked quite anonymous. Me on the other hand, with my long bright pink hair, made me only the more visible. Me and my friends started wondering if we should talk to someone, like the lady in the bar, but feared we would just sound paranoid and weird. As we could no longer see the man, we decided to pay and leave quickly before he returned. If he suddenly appeared, we would just call for the closest group of guys to help us. We began power walking down the street, looking behind us and everywhere in case he would appear. I suddenly felt much more sober due to the stress and decided it would be more smart to take another street to the hotel instead of the lit up and touristy one where we had seen him waiting. After all, he had clearly noticed we were scared, and by all logic, we would follow that street. So we quickly ran down that other street and a few blocks down, back to the lit up one. I stopped for a second to catch my breath and looked up the street with the ice cream bar, and he was indeed standing there in the middle of the street, looking up towards the wine bar we had just left, kind of walking around to look from other angles. I then knew we had not been paranoid at all, and he had been deliberately waiting for us. He had been so determined he had been waiting for more than two hours. Just this effort seemed too much for a random creep. My friend turned around too and saw him and freaked out. We started running down the street as close to the shops as possible, in front of people so it would block the sight of us if he turned around. It was about a 15 minute walk to our hotel, but we got there so much quicker, always turning around. It honestly felt like the scariest moment of my life. As we started running, I started thinking, but what if he's not alone? What if he had chosen us and had been messaging someone along with our location? Maybe he'd seen us days before going to the same bar and had worked out our schedules. And if so, how long had he been watching us? To say the least, I barely slept that night and I felt so thankful that I had even noticed him lurking. Perhaps I'm overreacting, but my logic and all the weirdness around this makes me feel like we had just barely escaped something potentially horrifying. The first house that my mum and stepfather bought after they got pregnant with my sister had a few weird things happen. When she got old enough to communicate, she would wake up with a rash on her back, crying about the bees on the ceiling. That was pretty much the extent of what happened in the actual house. But we had a detached garage, probably 30 feet away from the back door of the house. And the garage had a loft that I decorated and hung out in when I was in my early teens. It started when I was jamming to music one day and thought I heard someone come in. And being rattled through the toolbox downstairs, I shut my music off and called out to no one there. I turned my music back on a little while later, thinking I was hearing a quiet conversation going on as if someone was on the phone. I turned my music back off and called out again to no one. So I turned on my music quieter and swore I could hear some more rattling and someone open and closed the door to leave. I packed up my stuff and go into the house to ask around and nobody has been in the garage all day but me. 
I stopped hanging out up there. More and more I got a really eerie feeling about the garage, to the point where I don't like to even have my back to it in broad daylight because it makes me feel strange. Sometime later I was telling my friend about it and he was like, oh my dad has a camera, let's see what happens when we leave the camera there. So in the evening, as the sun was setting, he gets his dad's camera, and we sit up there facing the front room. In the garage, you climb up a ladder in the back of the room, up into a large hole in the floor of the loft, and if you look towards the front of the room, you can see where the barn doors of the loft crack open and leave in a bit of light. So this is a rectangular little camera that's got nothing fancy about it, very much like the ones that most people own. We have the lights off, set it facing the front, and as we descend, I take note that there's a little blue light on the back of the camera as it's recording, since I've already been tasked with retrieving the camera when we're done, and I want to remember what I'm looking for. So we go and talk with my mum who thinks I'm crazy. 20 minutes later, we go up to fetch the camera and the blue light is gone. What the hell? I reach out and feel for it and realize the camera has rolled over, not even onto its flat screen, but then once more onto its narrow top side to face the back wall of the garage. I grabbed it and bolted faster than I ever had in my life. We watched the recording and sure enough, about five minutes later, after seeing nothing, we then heard a thud and watched the camera seemingly roll over alone with enough momentum to not stop on the wide flat side, but to the next narrow end. We tried to leave the camera up overnight, but his dad came to get it and I never saw the recording again. My friend and I decided to go on a late night drive to find this creepy cemetery one night. Great start to a story I know, but we were bored and in a small town with nothing else to do. After about 40 minutes of driving, we got to the state park. Now, typically, parks are closed after dark, but these roads were still public access, so they weren't off limits to general drivers. However, we were the only ones on the road at this point, and it was isolated, we thought. The lanes were surrounded by thick trees and it was dark, no street lights kind of dark. We were on a narrow dirt lane looking for this cemetery, but we drive by it unknowingly. The area we were driving through was kind of like a square of roads, with only one way in and out. We get to the crossroads, where the road we are on goes straight through, or you can continue back through by a left turn only. Next to the ditch across the road from us, we see a dark green sedan pulling to the brush. No lights on, no people around, not an accident from all we could tell. Whatever, kind of weird. But we slowly turn left and begin the loop back around looking for the small rows of old headstones again. As we get back around to the intersection about five minutes away, the green sedan is still pulled off in the bushes, but now it's not only the vehicle there. There's a big pickup truck, idling in the dark across from us, blocking the straightaway. Now, it had to have come from the other direction, since no cars passed us, or were in front or behind us. That was the way we had planned to go, to leave the park since we hadn't found what we had been looking for, but we couldn't pass through. This truck was in the middle of the road, taking up all the space on either side. At first, we were thinking this guy probably got his car stuck and called for help. Then, this truck guy turns on his headlights, actually his high beams, and begins revving his engine hard. My friend and I exchange looks, like wonder who's overcompensating for something. And when we turn back, trying to see through the blinding lights, we see a silhouette of a big bulky man standing in front of the truck, hands on hips just standing there. We aren't but a car's length and a half away from this guy, and there's nowhere left to go. 
which we know just leads us back around to the same place. We sit there staring at each other for a few moments trying to decide what to do. My friend starts pulling the car forward at snail pace, trying to keep as much distance between us and this truck as possible. And we make it turn left. He's just standing there not moving, just looking in our direction. We weren't scared yet really. But I'm a bit paranoid generally. So I was waiting for him to lunge at the car throw something at us or something. I don't know. It just really felt off. After we turn, I check the rear view and see the guy holding something as he takes a few steps behind our car in the outline of the light. It's long, barrel shaped and threatening looking. We peel out of there now wanting to put distance between us, but forgetting we are stuck in this square of roads. When we get back to about halfway between the start of the straightaway and the truck, whose headlights we can still see, we pull off to the side of the road, trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. I look out the window and see that we are sitting right next to the cemetery we had been looking for. But we are both too freaked out to get out. And we laugh at the irony for a second. Then we see headlights coming from behind us. Oh crap. It's the guy we think. As it gets closer, we see it's a white SUV and it slows next to our car. The window is rolled down and it's a car full of guys our age. What are you guys up to out here? The driver says. We say that we're just out for a drive. And they say some things we can't hear to each other. My friends and I don't have a strong menacing aura. So we hoped we could just send some chill vibes and have them leave us off the hook for whatever was going on. Were they in with the truck guy? Because this wasn't truck guy, but this just all seemed too weird. We asked if they'd seen a truck up ahead, where they had driven by, but they said that they hadn't. When we looked back, we noticed the lights coming from the oncoming direction were gone. They laughed and pulled away slowly, telling us to have a good night, and we pulled back onto the road to take off for the exit. Only looking out the windows for long enough to notice that the sedan was still there. We made it back to his parents house without further incident and told them about this strange encounter, but couldn't really explain what had happened. It still sounds kind of stupid when I talk about it. But something was going on. Still, it could have just been a guy out fixing a car late at night. But why the aggressive behavior? And who were the people in the SUV? And why did they suddenly appear? I'm just glad nothing worse happened. I avoid state parks at night, but my friend, he's still a maniac camping in the woods alone. And he's seen some stuff. I've been a night shift worker for over 20 years. I've worked various locations up and down the country. But one that I'll never forget was a private cemetery. These were people who were old money, had more than enough for someone to protect their house, their gardens, and of course, the private cemetery at the back of their property. There was a little guardhouse located near an access road, which was on private property anyway. And I was stationed in this tiny little cubicle, and just to walk around the cemetery every hour to make sure there was nothing funny going on. So this is what I did for about two years. I'd set my alarm, walk out every two hours with my flashlight, walk the same small route which lasted no more than two and a half minutes, and sit my butt down and do whatever it was I was doing at the time. Back then, I usually just listened to the radio, read some magazines, and anything that would help pass the time. By the time the sun came up, someone else would come and take over and look after the cemetery as well. And I believe a gardener would come once a week to make sure it was nice and maintained. This was a family cemetery, of course. The graves were quite spread out. And I think there was nearly 200 years of family members buried on this same small patch of grass. Apparently, 
it was their aspirations to all be buried in the same area as a family, which is nice in a way. Really impressive tombstones that were always well maintained, made of the top materials, with gold leaf and everything. Pictures on the freshest of graves, really beautiful stuff. By all accounts, a truly lovely graveyard. It's a shame it's private, as I'm sure there are some people out there who would love to see it. In any case, beautiful graveyards isn't what this story is about. You see, when I worked nights, there was one time that something happened that really made me question whether I wanted to keep working there. Spoilers, I quit shortly after. The night in question was about eight years ago. I was on my phone scrolling through Facebook probably, and just waiting for my shift to end. It must have been about 4am. I was expecting light to come fairly soon, as it was summer and I was ready to go home, have a shower and pass out. I look at my alarm and even though it's a few minutes early, I start making my way round the cemetery. I just look around as always, nothing has changed, every leaf is in its place, every blade of grass is still, and every tombstone is the same. But something this time is different. I hear something. It sounds like footsteps coming from behind me. I turn around quickly, my flashlight pointing down the path, but there's nothing, nothing visible to my eyes anyway. But the sound, the stomping of boots, it sounds like, is very pronounced and making its way down the path. I shine my flashlight in all directions and the sound carries on coming my way. By the time it nearly reached me, I legged it all the way to the security house. And I'm pretty sure that I ran right through it. Because not a second into me running, did I get hit by a wave of cold. I don't really know how to describe it. It was like I was inhabiting a space that I wasn't meant to be in for a split second. But the moment I kept on running, did it go away and I kept on going. I didn't carry on my rounds that night. I occasionally peeked out the window just to make sure that I wasn't losing my mind. I didn't think anyone was there, not anyone I could see anyway. I think it's important to point out that I am a very skeptical person. I've had friends who also do night shift work tell me stories about strange things that have happened to them. And I'm always the first one to call out BS. In any case, I returned to work the following night, convinced that I must have had some momentary lapse of fear, judgment, whatever you call it, and that it never really happened. I'd spent the whole day telling myself that was the case, and I was believing it. But at about the same time that next day, when I was making the rounds again, I didn't hear those bootsteps, oh no. I heard someone whisper in my ear, You don't belong here. It was a small, female voice, almost like that of someone's grandmother. And just like that, I soiled myself, ran to the guardhouse and didn't leave. When my shift was over, I walked up to the main house. I was quite friendly with the owner back then, and said to him, Look, Barry, I've been working here a number of years, and honestly, I think it's time for me to move on. He was cool with that. We're still buddies and occasionally drink to this day. But the real reason I quit between you and me was because of that voice and those bootsteps. I've carried on working night shifts and have never experienced anything remotely similar to that again, and I'm glad of it. I'm not sure if it was a ghost or whatever, but nonetheless, I'd rather never find out. This happened a while ago. I was in a hospital with my parents on the outskirts of a city of a huge campus filled with trees and forest. I had just had minor surgery performed on me. After the surgery, it was almost evening 
and we decided to stay there for the night and head back home the next day, as I was still weak from the operation. My dad went to search for a nearby hotel, but most hotels near the hospital and the medical college campus were already full by then. There were a few with very expensive rooms. It wasn't a big city and quite near to a mountain, so our options were limited. My dad told me to eat at the restaurant nearby while he continued to search, and he returned half hour later saying he'd found a good guest house. We were relieved, and we drove in a cab to get there. It was a bit far into the forest trail, completely surrounded by trees. But then after a while we reached it. It looked serene. We went inside and asked for a room on the ground floor if possible as I couldn't walk much. However, the guy at the reception said the only room available at the time was on the second floor. So we just had to go there. But I was happy that we at least got a room. It was large and spacious with two beds. And all this for even cheaper than the small awful rooms that we had seen earlier. We asked why it's so cheap. And the guy said that the guest house is only for the patients and their families. So cheap. And we were quite happy and settled into the room. Strange goings on started happening from that moment. It was a winter evening so quite cold, but something weird was going on with the windows. It was a big room, the windows were besides the bathroom in the corner. And there were no buildings, just trees, quite a hilly area. My dad got up to freshen up. And I told him to close the window while he was going to the bathroom. Half hour or so after I went to the bathroom and found the windows were still open. I told my dad and asked if he forget if it was so cold. But my dad said he did. I thought he forgot. We didn't think much of it and closed the window. When we went to have dinner, we went downstairs, but there was no one in the dining hall, just the chef. We asked where the rest of the people were. And he said that most of them had already eaten and gone to bed. But it was only 8pm. Surprised and a little confused we ate the food was surprisingly good despite the low price we paid. So we were happy. And then things started to get strange. Once we reached our room, my dad realized his phone was missing. We searched everywhere in the room and asked my dad where he had left his phone. He said he'd left it on the bedside table, but it was nowhere to be seen. That's when I noticed the window was open again. I asked my mum and dad if they had opened the window for whatever reason, and they had not. Now I know for sure I had closed the window. It was weird. We thought some thief must have come through the window, but it wasn't possible. The windows were locked from within. We were on the second floor with just trees around us. Nevertheless, we kept searching for the phone. We were sure as hell it wasn't in the dining hall because my parents are very compulsive about these things and always check before they leave. But nonetheless, we still went down. When we arrived, we saw no one was there in the dining hall. We searched high and low and there was no phone. There was no one on the ground floor either. No one at the reception. We assumed everyone must have gone to sleep, but it was barely 8.30pm. We wanted to contact someone in the reception. And when we went there, there was no one there. But oddly enough, my dad's phone was below the desk of the reception. We assumed my dad had forgot and left it there when we arrived. But when we got back to our room, my earphones were now gone. I knew I had put them on the bed before leaving for dinner. But now they were nowhere to be found. After a lot of searching, we found them under the bed, deep under. It was strange. I was just relieved that I got them. Then we were chilling for a bit. My parents were chatting, me playing some games on my phone when suddenly we heard a woman screaming. She was crying in our native language to please not hurt her and leave her alone. We thought a couple was having a fight besides us in one of the rooms. It was very unsettling to hear her cries. And it suddenly stopped. Me and my dad got up to see what the fuss was all about. When we left the room, we saw no one outside. We thought, let's check if everything is alright. 
The room beside us was locked, so we went to the next room. It was locked too. We went to the next. Every room on our floor was locked. We got curious. Where did the sound come from? We went to the first floor, and the same thing. They were all locked from the outside. And after going down to the bottom floor, all the rooms there were locked as well. All the rooms in the guest house were locked. There was nobody except us. Why did they say all the rooms were booked and gave us that room on the second floor when we asked for a room on the ground floor? Where did the scream come from? Where were all the people? At this point, my dad was starting to get irritated. He wanted to speak to someone and we went searching, but no one was there in the reception. No one at the adjacent room besides the dining room for staff. We went to the entrance to find someone outside as the doors were locked from the outside. We were locked in a guest house with no one inside. We kept banging and shouting to open the door and no one did. My dad just said, at the end, let's go to the room and wait till morning. Something seems very fishy. We went back and while we were there, my mom was reading some texts from a spiritual book. She always has this book with her and she was quite scared. She said that after she went away, she heard the voice of a woman again. She was laughing like a maniac now. She was scared and began chanting the mantras, hoping no harm will come. As you can imagine, we didn't get a moment's sleep that night. When we woke up in the morning, we grilled the supervisor and he didn't offer us much explanation. It all seemed rational to them. Turns out that the guy on duty went to sleep for the night in a nearby apartment. They locked all the doors for safety reasons, apparently, because freedom to leave isn't included in the price you pay, apparently, and that if we really wanted to leave, we could have just shouted to the guard. That was the person who was outside, but they ignored us when we tried doing that. So there you go. Apparently it's all for security to prevent break-ins and stuff. In any case, we were just glad to leave that place. It was giving us seriously bad vibes. We hopped in our cab and drove away. Let me start by setting the scene. On December 3rd, 2014, my birthday, I'm preparing to leave my office to begin my birthday celebrations. When I get called into my boss's office, Chris, I'm sorry to tell you this on this day, especially, but business is bad and we're going to have to let you go. I'm stunned. I leave the office making a vague remark that I'll collect my stuff in a few days. I jump on the subway to collect my girlfriend who worked at a human rights law firm. She finished her day and meets me. But inside the usual hugs and kisses, she keeps her distance. I know that when she does this, it's because she lost a case. So I make small talk as we hit the street. Stopping suddenly, she turns to me and explains, Sorry, Chris, I can't do this anymore. It's not you, it's me. Before I get a chance to answer, she hails a cab and off she goes. Wow. Birthday. No job no love of my life, all in the space of two hours. This situation needs alcohol and badly. I reached the bar where I was meeting my friends for my birthday celebration. I got drunk very quickly. Copious amounts of red wine chased with beer and shots. I argued with everyone insulted a few and was politely asked to leave by a steroid infused doorman. I found myself in the middle of London at midnight staggering home. By 2am I reached halfway to my house when my phone buzzed, a withheld number. In my self pitied filled state, I thought it was my girlfriend. Darling, I ain't your darling you scumbag. I stood there looking at my phone. Who is this? You'll find out soon enough. I cursed and staggered another 90 minutes home. My legs had had enough. I hit the floor and almost crawled into bed and passed out. The next afternoon I woke up. 
remembered in fits and starts what had happened. I got really angry, then began the process of finding a new job and extracting my belongings from my old job and my ex girlfriend. Then just before midnight, my phone rings another withheld number. Uh, Amanda? This isn't her scumbag. Who is this? You'll know soon enough. I work as a salesman in technology raising money for startups. So I have a wide and deep network, but I'm also very private. I have a small family and few trusted friends. I rang around and asked if anyone was getting calls. No one. This was the start of a very exhausting six weeks. The calls would come in at night, sometimes early evening, sometimes early morning. I would answer the ones in the evening as a lot of my contacts and clients used withheld numbers. The ones in the morning would just go to voicemail. At first it was the same few words, the word scumbag, a few cusses added for good measure. And the voice was male, but sometimes a female would be first and then it would be passed to the male. I recorded the voicemails and played them at the local police, but as there was no direct threat, or I could not identify the person. Sadly, there was very little that they could do. Eventually things came to a head when I started getting emails. Watch out for LinkedIn contact info folks, stating in graphic detail what they were going to do to me. This time the police could do a bit more about their tracing, but they couldn't find a location in the UK. The scum were using anonymous email tech. Finally, one evening, in the middle of snow filled January at about 834 in the evening, the phone rings another withheld number. And I answer as I'm waiting for clients to confirm a new assignment. Hello, scumbag. Did you get the emails? Yeah, I did. And and I think you really should quit while you're ahead. I spoke very calmly. Hey, scumbag. I ain't finished with you yet. I cut my stalker off and explained clearly. Listen, my soon to be spending his short assed life in an unbelievably incredible amount of pain. Let me tell you what's going to happen now. Instead of you harassing me, I'm going to hunt you. And then I'm going to capture you and your girl. And then I'm going to cook your girl as part of a special enchilada dish. Then we're going to eat her and wash her down with a nice Argentinian red. Then my friend, I'm going to make a dessert out of you. You see my amateur stalker friend, I'm going to go full Hannibal Lecter on you. Now, the only way to stop these culinary adventures of mine is to stop your ramblings right now. So make a decision. There was a long silence, then a squeak. Sorry. And then the line cut. I haven't heard from my would be stalker friend in a long time. Love to have you over for dinner. I'll even provide the wine. In any case, let's not meet. I grew up in the suburbs of Charlotte, North Carolina. My parents bought a house from the 70s complete with colorful toilets pink and periwinkle, and lots of vibrant wallpaper. The house was not open concept in the slightest with four doors to the outside, two staircases, and with many easy storage places and walls one could hide behind without someone in the next room having any idea where they were. The house has always creeped me out, even though we now have normal white toilets. One day my brother and I left for school and my dad left for work, leaving my mum alone to get ready for work. While in the kitchen, she heard the electric pencil sharpener going off upstairs as if someone was sharpening a pencil on and off repeatedly for several minutes. She hauled us out the house and called the sheriff to investigate. The sheriff walked through the entire house, checking every little crevice behind every wall for signs of an intruder. When he got to the office, he noticed the storage closet that was never used was wide open and there were the freshly sharpened pencils sitting on the desk. He couldn't explain what he saw, but it would be extremely easy for someone to slip in and out of one of the various entrances without anyone knowing. 
Things got even weirder when a few days later, my mum and I found another perfectly sharpened pencil in the passenger seat of her car. This all happened 11 years ago, and the weird pencil finding stopped there. But we are still convinced someone was stalking my mum, and we have dubbed this person the pencil man, and blame him whenever something goes missing, or isn't where it should be. This just happened in October, and was the first encounter I've ever had with something paranormal during the day. I was on vacation with my parents in Salem, aka Witchtown. For as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated with creepy and spooky things, especially in the Salem witch trials. Hell, I even collect original pictures from the late 1800s and early 1900s. So when my parents gave me a choice between Salem or Rhode Island, you can bet where I decided to go. It makes it even better that we were there for Halloween. Our original plan was for the week of Halloween since where we were staying had rooms available. But my dad and I were also going to a concert on November 1st, and we didn't want to deal with the rush to get home on time. I meticulously planned this vacation out by the hour because there were so many places I wanted to visit. One of the places on the itinerary was the Howard Street Cemetery. Originally, I wanted to go to the old Burying Point Cemetery, but it was closed for renovations. For those of you who aren't aware, the Howard Street Cemetery was reportedly the field where Giles Corey was pressed to death during the witch trials. Once we actually got there, I was focused on taking pictures of all the gravestones. I tend to gravitate towards the older or more broken ones, as well as those covered in debris. If I find one like that, I'll usually brush away whatever it is, because I feel like whoever is buried there deserves a little courtesy. This day I ended up doing that by going to a free graves before taking pictures. But when my parents and I were about to leave, I felt something grab my arm. Just so that you're aware, I don't like being touched for multiple reasons. As I was taking pictures, I noticed another woman walk into the cemetery, so I assumed it was her grabbing me. But when I turned around, there was no one there. Even the area around the cemetery was vacant except for the three of us. My parents were in front of me as well, and this grab came from behind, so it couldn't have been them. My mum asked if I was okay, and I explained what happened and told her I thought it was a woman, the one who walked in earlier. She said she left a while ago. I was confused because my mum was basically dragging me out of the cemetery, because she doesn't mess with the occult or anything dealing with spirits. The grab wasn't even forceful or angry, it was more gentle, as if they wanted me to stay. I've been trying to come up with a theory as to how this could have happened, and... I have a few. One is that one of the spirits roaming the cemetery was glad for my company and didn't want me to leave. And the other is that maybe it was someone who was just glad to see someone else taking an interest in not using the cemetery as a drinking spot. Last year, my 14 year old cousin took their own life which was heartbreaking for the entirety of my family. I'm ashamed to say we weren't particularly close due to an almost 10 year gap, and also us both being fairly introvert. But his passing broke my heart, especially as someone who was also feeling the same way at that age. Now we both primarily interacted during family get togethers with small talk, a brief hug and stuff like that. We didn't interact outside of it, so I had no way of knowing about what he was going through. None of my family did. So his passing was entirely shocking to everyone. There was no humanly possible way I could have known about what he was planning to do. That being said, I was laying on my back one night in bed on my computer watching some YouTube video. It was a very standard and lazy sort of day, a nice weekend after a fairly basic week. Nothing was abnormal about it, and at 10 o'clock I became overpowered by this sudden terrible fear that left me feeling completely paralyzed. 
I can't put this fear into words, but it was as if this gigantic weight suddenly fell on top of me, pinning me down to the bed. I opened my mouth as if to breathe, but it felt like I couldn't. I physically couldn't breathe. I was absolutely terrified. As a healthy woman, I have never had any variety of health defects or concerns. I've had sleep paralysis in the past, but nothing like this. As I was laying in bed, a single sentence circulated in my head. I don't want to go. It just kept repeating. I managed ragged breaths in the midst of this paralyzing ordeal. And after a few minutes, which felt like forever, I was able to sit up and breathe normally again. But I was chilled to the bone, with absolute terror and heartache. I couldn't explain what happened, and I didn't sleep well that night. But I woke up fairly fine. I tried not to think about what happened to me, so I carried on with the day as normal. But then during the afternoon, my mum came home from errand running and told me the news. My cousin had passed the day before. I asked her when it happened, and she told me that he left the house around six to go for a walk and was found around midnight. Remembering that night still makes me feel cold. I've had premonitions in the past as well as encounters with ghosts, but never anything like this. I continue to wonder why I felt it. This happened some years ago. When I had the iPhone 4S, I was laying in bed when I received a phone call. I forget who exactly it was or what exactly they claimed to be offering, but it was fairly obviously a scam of some sort. Well, not obviously enough. This lady was asking me for various details of personal information, which I was giving for some reason. I believe I've read about how people are willing to give up all sorts of information as long as they are asked by someone with the illusion of power or something like that. I was readily handing out my name, email address, confirming my phone number, and it wasn't until she asked for my home address that my common sense kicked in. I didn't need this lady or anyone affiliated with her making house calls, or even so much as sending me garbage mail. Why do you need my address? I asked. So I can process you, she replied. It sounded reasonable. It even made sense, assuming she was claiming to be doing whatever it was legitimately. But I no longer had the blind faith to hand out any information, in hopes that it was. My exact location was pretty much the last detail I was still hanging on to, and I had now decided not to relinquish it. Nothing too creepy had happened yet. Obviously, just politely, I declined and hung up. Well, that was where I ran into trouble. Now she was literally using my name every time she said something to me. After I said nothing to her last statement, she repeats, Can I have your address, please, Sakura? I say nothing, take my phone away from my head and tap the in call button on screen, but nothing happens. The touch screen is now completely unresponsive. I'm unable to end my call. I vaguely know how easy it would have been not too long previously had I kept my cool as hell Motorola Razor. Still not saying anything, I hold the lock button until the slide to power off option appears. Of course, my touchscreen is still unresponsive, so this was not a solution after all. Thinking back on it now, I could have just kept holding the lock screen button until the phone would have force powered off. But I guess I wasn't aware of that feature at the time. I had experienced this stupid unresponsive touchscreen issue before and during phone calls. This wasn't the first time I was unable to end phone calls on my own, but I knew that once the call was ended by the other person, the touchscreen functionality would return. But typically the person I'm talking to isn't completely intent on keeping me on there until I relinquish all my secrets. I continued to say nothing. Not only had I decided to not give up my address, but I wasn't even going to give away any more of my voice. So I lay the phone on my bed near me 
and buried my head in the pillow waiting for her to give up and end the call. But she didn't. I could still hear her a short distance away. Give me your address, Sakura. I ignored her and stayed laying there. What is your address, Sakura? I've been silent for a while now. Any normal person would have likely given up on the conversation, but not this she witch. She still repeated her question, and I searched my brain for a solution. I found one. It's a fairly last resort. I take a trick from my experience jailbreaking my eye device. I seize my phone, which is still transmitting an attempt to ascertain my location, and hold the lock and home button until my phone is put in DFU mode. This essentially bricks it temporarily. I guess you put your phone in this mode when you are recovering your device, as well as for some jailbreaks. Finally, my link to this woman was severed. I brought my phone back from the DFU mode, and everything was fine after that. I wondered if she somehow had the ability to disable ending the phone call. I now figure it was just a coincidence that the unresponsive touchscreen glitch happened during the call. That's about it though. It was just a really creepy situation to be in, laying there in the dark, being unable to hang up on her, and her repeating the need for my address over and over. I never got another phone call about it, never so much as an email. Maybe it wasn't a scam and I missed the chance of a lifetime. However, judging by her willingness to talk to thin air for a few minutes, I doubt it. My best friend and I went to see Star Wars Episode 7 with her cute brother. They were super close and eventually we got to all hanging out as much as we could. We were all dressed up tastefully as grown adults. My bestie toted a Jedi look. Her brother pulled off a solid hand solo. And I pulled off a close and well done Ray, minus the hair. None of us broke bank. We went to the theatre and had a blast. It was the first or second night of showing, so it was slammed, and we probably got out just before midnight. I carpooled back to my bestie's apartment where I took my car to go home, as I live about 20 minutes from her place. It was about a quarter past midnight when it happened. I was about five minutes from her house, when within a split second of registering, a white blob came from nowhere and slammed into my windshield. Whatever it was splashed across the entire windshield because it was so large. For some reason the lights were off for that section of the street, the only real lighting offered by the vibrant gas station lighting a minute back. Shaken up, I couldn't see through my windshield. But I was afraid to stop, and I couldn't see to turn around and get to the well -lit gas station. The best option I had was to crawl slowly and prayed I hit nothing. I was coming up to a cement median, so I used that as a guide through my driver window. The windshield wiped enough after a solid minute or two of running the wipers continuously. I hit the red stoplight at the end of the strip, where I promptly texted my bestie that I'd been hit by something that impacted my vision, where she promptly offered to send her brother right away. The white stuff was cleared off my windshield significantly better, so I was okay driving home. Because of where I was and the fact the light was out, there were no cameras. I didn't think of calling the police, or that it could have done any good. When the blob came out of nowhere, I couldn't remember if I was by any vehicles or not. I was so tired from spending the day with them and getting out of that movie late, to where I still don't know half of what happened. I know it took a few weeks for some of those spots to wash off the glass. I told my mum in the morning who freaked out and told me that I should have called the cops. Apparently when the windshield fluid was cleaning the white stuff off my window it actually made it worse. This was an ongoing trend for gang initiations, to do things like this to victims. I called them and logged a report, and roughly when it happened, but never heard from them again. Another tactic was laced paper with narcotics that make you pass out from touching it. 
In any case, I learnt my lesson. Always call the police when something weird happens to you. Oh, and if you get hit with white stuff, do not use the windshield fluid on it. I live in Lompoc, California. I also live across the street from the cemetery. I used to hop the fence on one side of the cemetery to go to a friend's house who lived on the opposite side. If I went around, it would easily be around a four to five block walk to her house. So yes, I used the cemetery as my route. The keeper of the grounds who lived there called the cops on me several times, so I stopped. I also have been driving for years now, so there's no need anymore. Anyway, on one of my walks over to my friends, I notice a tree house has been in the cemetery off to the side. It was in a trench in a deep wooded area. There's been a few nights when I've gone out and hung out inside of this treehouse with a few friends over the years. However, every time I went, I would see spirits. Yes, I was scared many times, but seeing my friends happy and enjoying themselves made everything worth it. Except one night in December 2018, when I had brought new friends with me. During this time, I was going through a lot and kind of going through a bad group of friends. I brought some to this treehouse. Like I have mentioned, I see at least something, but it's only for a few seconds. This time, however, I saw a rather large man, kind of burly yet completely transparent. I feel him before I see him. I feel how sad and lost he is, but I can feel how gentle his soul was, and he was only looking for help. Since I could feel him, I started hearing footsteps, breaking twigs, leaves and such. My friends hear this too. I look over and I see this man, and all I can feel is how confused he is. He starts walking up, but freezes once I saw him. I yell out to him that it's okay, and we're not gonna hurt him. I told him he's okay being here if he wants to stick around, but then my friends wanted to leave, as they were quite freaked out. I walked around a bit, and he walked in front of me and disappeared. I don't think I really helped him considering I didn't have the chance, being with that group of friends and all, but I could feel how gentle he was. Sometimes I feel that gentle presence whenever I visit the graveyard and I think of him. Today I went because today was the anniversary of me losing a friend, and I felt that gentle presence when I visited the graveyard today. My house, which I rent, has a ground floor and two more floors, so three in total. I was getting ready to go out, and I went to the first floor, in my room to get my makeup. I went to the second floor in my flatmate's room, to do my makeup there. I go back to my room about 45 minutes later, and I see three of my purses on the floor, and the shoulder handle, has been cut on two of them and a little bit on the third one. Both purses are cut in the same way in the same spots. I start freaking out a bit because no one was in the house except me and my flatmate, and we've been living together upstairs the whole time. In the living room, which is on the ground floor, we had left the back window open, so the air could ventilate, and we had had some people over the night before. The door in the living room leads to a tiny garden which is protected by a tall fence, which is more protected by a wired fence, and I doubt anyone could have just climbed it and come in, cut purses, take no money or cards from either of them and then leave. The complex has eight flats, so all the tiny gardens are connected in a long line, but we are only connected to one, as we are the last flat in this line so absolutely nothing was stolen or even moved, and we see no marks anywhere. But it's still weird, so I call the police to find an explanation. They come, checked the evidence, there was a wet spot on the carpet in a room about five centimeters long, and how the purses are cut. I thought it was a fox that went in the house, went upstairs, ate the bags and left. Based on facts, that a fox tried to enter the living room one time, in the same way a few weeks ago. 
The police said it was not an animal cut. It was most probably a knife cut and asked if we had any problems with anyone like an ex or something. We do not. Most people do not even know where I live and especially how to get to one's room as the house is pretty complicated. The stairs in the house are metal and spiraled and you basically hear it from every spot in the house if someone is on the stairs. Police call forensics to ask for advice and they say they do not know what they could do as they can't take fingerprints off the bags because of the texture and the wet spot is apparently dry now. Police say they've never heard of anything like it and it makes no sense. They marked it off as a burglary and left. I have to mention that the night to morning before we had the music pretty loud and one neighbor texted us very angrily to stop it. I mean, he knows the house as we have the same structure. He was the only one with access, but he's like 75 years old and all the encounters we had were really nice so far. So we were left with something or someone that comes to the house through the back garden that's protected by a very high wall and wired fence comes through the living room, passes by the PS4 TV, expensive speakers, goes onto the hallway, passes very expensive shoes, goes up the stairs, enters a bedroom, cuts the handle to the purses, doesn't take anything and then just leaves. I slept in my flatmate's room that night and today I went into my room to clean it up and I found one of the missing handle pieces in my bed under the blanket. What the hell is going on? I have no explanation for any of this and simply wish I did. Ever since I can remember, I've always had a vast cocktail of sleeping disorders, sleep paralysis, insomnia, lucid dreaming and nightmares. But lately I've been having something odd. A few years ago, I started noticing that my dreams began getting more and more bizarre as time went by. And soon, I started noticing small details in my dreams that came true the very next day. I would dream my friend in a red shirt. The next day she had one. I dreamed about a car crash. The next day I would see a car crash in the news. Usually very mundane in general. It didn't really freak me out much because I thought this is just regular day to day stuff and is a coincidence. But that's when things started to change. Two years ago, I went with my family to America for the first time. I was really excited to see Disney World, Universal and buy stuff from Hot Topic. But once there, I just felt very hollow. I guess I couldn't enjoy the trip. One day I woke up feeling awful, told my sister something horrible probably was about to happen. And less than half hour later, my grandmother passed and the feeling of dread left me. This started happening more and more often. I would dream about specific situations and they would come true the very next day. And this time they were not as mundane or common as before. I once had a dream where I saw an old friend from primary school. I hadn't seen or heard from her in 10 years. And the next day she appeared at my job. I'm just kind of starting to feel stuff before it happens. Has anyone else ever experienced this? Can I trust these feelings? I usually don't believe in anything that cannot be proven by science, but something tells me I have to believe in this.